Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the September meeting of the Tennessee Real Estate Commission. And we have a few formalities to handle initially. Ms. Maxwell, will you read your first uh, statement of the day into yes. the record? This meeting's date, time, and location have been noticed on the Tennessee Real Estate Commission's website, included as a part of this year's meeting calendar since August the 12th of 2014. Additionally, the agenda for this month's meeting has been posted on the Tennessee Real Estate Commission's website since Friday, August the 31st, 2015. The meeting has also been noticed on the 10.gov website since Friday, August the 31st of 2015. I'll call the roll now. Uh, Grease? Here. Dachara? Here. Bloom? Here. Franks? Here. Hills? Here. McMullen? Here. Taylor? Here. Wood? Here. Everyone is present. Thank you, Ms. Maxwell. At this time, I'm going to ask Commissioner McMullen to lead us in an invocation and then the pledge to the flag. Commissioner McMullen. Thank you. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, for this day that you've given us, we thank you. We pray that you would be with all those who serve the public. We pray that they would work with wisdom and energy and strength. Dear God, we pray that you would bless all those who work in this industry and pray that you would bless them with prosperity and that they would work in integrity in all that they do. We pray that in all things, your will would be done. We thank you for these lives that you've given us, and we pray that we would use them in a way that would bring honor to you. We pray this and everything in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please stand. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, members of the Commission, you have the agenda in front of you. Are there any additions or corrections you'd like to make before we adopt the agenda? Mr. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to add uh, just an item for us to discuss uh, about the rules, wherever it fits into our agenda. Uh, I, I think I'm told that the applicant or the individual is supposed to be here at 1015 f for an informal appearance is not going to be here. Is that right? That is correct. So let's add that, if it's all right with you, Commissioner Bloom, following Mr. McCormick. All right. Other additions? Chairman, I move that we adopt the agenda as amended. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner McMullen, seconded by Commissioner DeChar, that the agenda be adopted as amended. Discussion? Let's vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. You all have been sent a copy of the minutes from last month's meeting. Are there changes? Motion to approve. Second. Okay. I have a motion by Commissioner Char, seconded by Commissioner Hills, that the agenda be, uh, the um, uh, minutes be approved from last month's meeting. Before we vote on that, you may recall that we adopted a policy regarding when a license becomes active. And Ms. Kirby has drafted that or reduced it to writing. And I think maybe before we approve the minutes, if you would like to tell us what you've how you interpreted our conversation and make sure we've got that right before we vote. That'll be great. The Tennessee Real Estate Commission adopted the following policy on the effective date of new licensee licenses. A licensee may participate in the acts regulated by the Tennessee Real Estate Broker License Act of 1973 so long as the license shows active on verifytn.gov, even if the licensee does not yet have possession of the paper license. You also have the Auctioneers Commission? I do not. Okay, just check it. <laughs> All right. Did everybody get to hear that and understand it and believe it to be correct? Yes. Okay, so incorporated in the motion to approve the minutes then will be that language if that's, a, if that's all right with everybody. All right, other changes, corrections or additions? 
Let's vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The motion passes unanimously, but I suspect Ms. Fontaine Taylor and Ms. Bobby Woods would like to rec recuse themselves on that vote. That's a great idea. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I'm not trying to lead, guide, or direct you, but I don't think you were here last month. <laughs> All right. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. That brings up a good point. It may be uh, appropriate at this time to introduce our two new members and welcome them. Uh, it will. I've got, you know, I've got an important person out in the audience, Mr. McCormack, and I didn't want to hold him up too much, but maybe we'll go ahead and do that. Um, for the audience's sake, let me just take you around this table for a second. So as you're here for a day and a half or so, whatever it takes us to get this meeting done, you'll know who's speaking. Jenica Smith is our paralegal. Mallory Kirby is a lawyer who represents the Tennessee, the Department of Commerce, but is assigned to the Real Estate Commission. Eve Maxwell is the executive director. We're going to speak about Eve and her position in just a few minutes. Ross White is director of education for the Tennessee Real Estate Commission. And then you have eight commissioners up here from across the state. Two of those commissioners, today is their first meeting. They've been assigned by the governor to be members of the Real Estate Commission. As a body, this group is thrilled to have them. They're filling two vacancies um, and we'll do my best just quickly, as a matter of fact, so you can hear these voices, Austin, why don't you start and tell just your name and where you're from. When, Bobby, when it gets to you, you've got to tell a little bit about yourself, though. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Austin McMullen, and I'm from Oak Hill, which is here in Nashville, Tennessee. Hi, right, Bobby. What do, what do we need to know about you? I'm Bobby Wooden from Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and um, that's about all you need to know about me, John. That's what not. No, no, that's <laughs> not. <laughs> what do you want to know? Well, no, I want you to tell us. You're, you're a real estate agent. I'm a real estate <laughs> agent. Been at it about 28 years and uh, feels longer, but 28 years. And uh, I'm a broker and uh, I'm a wise man. I remember today was my wife's birthday. So uh, other than that, we're good. All right. Thank you, Bobby. Marsha. Marsha Franks, and I'm from Franklin, Tennessee. Janet Duchara, and I'm from Jackson, Tennessee. I'm John Grease from Knoxville. Diane Hills from Kingsport. Uh, Gary Bloom from Memphis. Fontaine Taylor from Memphis, and okay. I'm a real estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> Fontaine is uh, here also first time ever as uh, looking at the audience instead of looking back at you all. I mean, looking, looking at you instead of looking <laughs> at us. But she's kind of a legend in West Tennessee, I'm told. But she, she's shy enough that she won't tell you about it. Uh, a couple of more things. Uh, for, for the audience's sake, we are recording the session. We record every session. You can find it if you'd like to watch it or again on YouTube. Um, you may or may not want to watch it after you get through with this meeting, but it's there. And if you want to watch other meetings, there's a lot of information that goes on and is passed back and forth that will be helpful to you. It's important for you to know that this commission is subject to the Sunshine Law which means we cannot discuss anything privately related to this agenda or items coming before the Real Estate Commission. So as we go through today and tomorrow, there's a possibility you go, that was the stupidest conversation I've ever heard. Well, it's the first time we've been able to talk about it, and we don't know what other people think for, for, from three grand divisions of the state of Tennessee. So we do it in the sunshine, and you're going to see all kinds of examples of that in the next day and a half. Let me make sure you all signed in. Make sure you sign out at the end of today, whenever that is. Tomorrow morning we have a formal hearing that starts at 9 o'clock with attorneys and an administrative law judge. We treat it like a courtroom. We will be the jury, and we need you here on time, so that make that effort, please, to respect the, the judge and the time that somebody's paying for. All right, with that said. Oh, yeah. If, if you've got a cell phone or iPad or some sort of tablet and you're busy uh, playing something or communicating with somebody, we ask that you don't do that except during breaks. We have eight commissioners up here. Seven are practicing real estate agents. Austin is a, a practicing attorney. He does not have a real estate license. And if he wants to bill somebody by the hour while we're up here, I bet he can do that. But we're kind of committed to not uh, communicating with our customers and clients and hope you will be as well. All right. 
I mentioned Ms. Maxwell, who's our current executive director. She has turned in her notice and is planning to retire. <laughs> and although nobody up here likes the concept, we've got to deal with it. And so I've asked uh, Brian McCormick, who's the assistant commissioner, and I can't f quite figure out how all this flows down, but in the, car the Department of Commerce and Insurance to come talk to us and, and participate in this conversation. And as uh, members of this commission know, when we get somebody up in front of us, we can ask them anything and we get away <laughs> with it almost always. But, but the topic, at least initially, is what are we going to do to replace Eve and turn her loose to enjoy life for a while, which I think is a pretty good goal or motivation to, to retire and get going. Brian, you want to introduce yourself to people who don't know you and where you fit in in the hierarchy? And sure. Um, I'm Brian McCormack. I'm Assistant Commissioner here at Commerce and Insurance, and I oversee the Regulatory Boards Division for the department, and that includes all of the professions that we license here. And could you me. talk a little closer to that mic? Sorry. <clears throat> all the profession. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. All the professions that we license in the state that are non-medical, um, not teacher. So it's we. You can imagine the, the professions, including yours, accountants, uh, contractors. I don't want to leave anybody out. Cosmetologists, but there's a <laughs> lot. There's about 30 programs to which we oversee, and so um, that's kind of this kind of my role here for the department. So uh, when, when I got the notice from Eve that she was going to hang it up, is that the right way to say it? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Say it however you like. <laughs> well, she'd also, she also had given notice to Brian. And so Brian and I have spoken, and we've talked about this. And we have uh, worked on a job description that you guys have seen, and I know there may be some input on that. So. We've got to, what does the law say? What do we have to do, post this for a period of time before we can start making a selection? Well, we'll, we'll start, I mean, I think the, the law requires, there's really pretty limited, um, and I'm, I, I'm not, there's attorneys in the room, so I, I don't wanna uh, misspeak here, but the law will give us, um, we'll, we'll, the plan that we would intend was to put the posting out um, here in the next week or so, and there, the specific job requirement is, and I'm, I'm gonna, pull this up here because it's related to um, you have to pass the broker's exam and that's the that's the main statutory requirement that's that's required for the director so um, let's you all received a copy of that job description mm -hmm. do we have copies of it somewhere in case people need to take a look at it I have copies and there's also a copy of this the applicable statute the, the applicable statute is on your iPad and then I have copies um, of the description if, if someone needs it I think some might need that just okay. to take a look at it. let me just okay mm -hmm. someone needs it statute is um, as I say is on the iPads it's 62 13 207 so that I mean and it really doesn't um, have that much information <clears throat> oh you're looking at looking over the I've, I've I brought Michael Driver. He is the uh, Deputy General Counsel for the Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance. He serves as the primary, <coughs> I guess, the Chief Legal Representative for the Division of Regulatory Boards. And so I like to have his expertise anytime we're answering legal questions. So, Unlike a real estate agent who can take care of legal questions on their own. <laughs> <laughs> I have no comment. <laughs> All right, uh, Commissioners, uh, comments? criticisms, additions, or deletions related to this uh, job description? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Franks. I would like to speak to um, um, the, the education requirement. Um, I, I see none other than uh, passing the Tennessee Brokers exam. Uh, one of the things that has really, really benefited this commission 
um, is um, uh, Eve's uh, background in, in law uh, as a practicing attorney. Um, so we know the education that goes with that. Um, I would be in hopes that we would uh, find someone with uh, a similar amount of uh, experience that Eve has. Uh, and even if it were not in law, that it be in either management or administration. Um, but I would like to see something about the education requirement to be in, in, in this uh, posting. Is that? And I'm, I'm glad to speak to that. I think we, we would definitely, um, I think adding, an educa adding some education language I think could be appropriate. Um, we, I, I, I did, in thinking about some of the master's level um, comments, I would, I would, I think it's something if you wouldn't be interested in saying it's something you would like to see, hope to see. I, w I would say that in some of the, in my, in my experience, this is actually my third director search that I've been a part of since I've been here. And one of the things that I found in, in the directors that we've hired, we've hired, I, I believe, and, and I, I, can, I, can I just take a moment to speak about Eve first? I, I wanted to get a chance to do that. I've, I've had an opportunity to tell a number of different people in the department, um, commissioner th yesterday, and, and s spoke with her staff. And I, I and I, like you all, I was very sad to hear that um, E was uh, stepping down. She's been a great, uh, really, really a great asset to the state of Tennessee. I don't think there's any question about that. And I personally, I, I have really enjoyed getting to know her. And um, we often chat, you know, at least once a day. And I'm, I'm just going to miss miss both the professional and, and the personal chats. So I, I just wanted to say that since you're all here and in the public, I've, I've I wanted to say that one more time, and I, I'll tell you, I did probably the same thing you said was, well, can I change your mind? <laughs> I think that was the first thing I said to Eve when she said it. So, um, but but I'll, I'll, I'll step aside and say that we've, we've got a number of great executive directors that serve here in the division of the regulatory boards, and we have various um, backgrounds that, that serve in these positions, and I will tell you, we have folks with bachelor's, bachelor's degrees and um, Eve being a lawyer, I'm a lawyer myself, so know that as I say this, I would I would just caution you to not make the posting too um, too specific in terms of your requirements because I, I will tell you, for instance, if you don't want, I would I would encourage you probably not to bind your hands in terms of if you want to hire, so you find an excellent candidate that just happens to have a bachelor's degree but has fantastic management experience, understands the real estate industry. I, I would just I would just caution, um, including like maybe restrictive language I think that would be my suggestion I know that I know I just went through the the search with the um, accountancy board and the accountancy board has a statutory requirement <coughs> um, to have that the that the uh, director have a, a CPA license and the board actually um, found someone that they identified they like so much that they're they've they put put that person in as an acting director um, who does not have a CPA license, does not have a master's degree, and I think they have found an absolute um, jewel of a candidate. And so I just, I would say, and, and they're now trying, to, they're proposing to the legislature that they take out the CPA requirement. That's how strongly the board felt. So I just, I would just say that to say, I wouldn't necessarily limit yourself in that. How long will, once you post the job, how long will you leave it posted before you actually start doing interviews and that type of thing kind of take us through the step by step on how this is going to work. We've we've got something to lay out, okay, and we can do that before we dispense with the job description, or we can do it in conjunction with it, whatever the pleasure of the commission <coughs> is. So if if the commission would prefer just get an overall picture of what we're thinking before we get to the job description, that's doesn't affect, doesn't affect what we're going to do by the end of the day. So what's the pleasure of commission? You want to get the job description done, then go to the process or incorporate the discussion of the process with the job description. Let's do the job description okay. first. Is there discussion on that? I mean, we may be close to getting this job description finalized. And, and one thing that I would like to say is that um, I, I've only been a, a commissioner for a year and a half, but in that length of time, I have seen um, our attorneys uh, come and go and take leave. And, and um, um, Eve has always been the glue to this whole thing. And sometimes when we had to have um, attorneys who would sit in for other attorneys, 
uh, it, it would either be Eve or, or Jenica, actually, that we would look to. Um, uh, and, and while I don't want to just say they must be an attorney, I, I want you to understand how important that that has been to us uh, where we were able to move forward with things uh, because of their expertise. Uh, and then also, um, um, Eve has been, um, sometimes, if she needed to work 80 hours, she would work 80 hours. Um, she, she works a lot of hours. So this person is going to have to be, um, I think they need to be aware of that, that this is not just a eight to five job. Um, and um, she has really uh, been de dedicated uh, to whatever it took to get the job done. Uh, and when, there, when we had no education director, Eve took, took care of that. So uh, it's a huge, huge, um, uh, it's of huge importance to us that that person be the right person. Is, and, I, and I've been on searches too for people, and I know it's difficult, uh, but um, uh, she has just been the, the glue that held all of this together, I feel like. Commissioner Franks, back to your concern about the education. Do you, do you want to offer a modification or under qualifications of some sort that says higher education is preferred, or do you have a... I, w I would like to say that, that, um, that a college degree uh, be um, mandatory uh, and a master's be preferred. Uh, I'll use that word preferred. Um, but I think a degree is definitely should be a part of it. And, and, I, and that degree should be in something that's applicable to this job. What do y'all think? Well, I'd like to speak against that for the reasons uh, Mr. McCormick just set out for us. If we find the right person for the job, the educa I mean, it's going to be a person that's several years past a degree. So that would not have a great deal of importance for me. I agree. I would also speak against it too. I do not have a college degree and yet I have when it comes to degrees in real estate I probably have more than most people so I think there are reasons people don't go to college or finish college and I think that would be it's nice to have that degree behind you but it shouldn't keep you back. What do you think, Ms. Franks? You want to? I disagree, but. Uh, do you want to make a motion to take a vote on it, or? Uh, I'll let somebody else make a motion if they would like. Okay, let's let's pass on your suggestion for the moment. Are there others <laughs> uh, additions or changes or suggested changes that a commissioner would like to make to this job description? If not, then the chair will entertain a motion to adopt this job description for posting purposes. So move. Second. That motion by Commissioner McMullen, seconded by Commissioner Duchara that the submitted <coughs> job description for the Executive Director of the Tennessee Real Estate Commission be adopted and approved as presented. Further discussion? All right, then let's vote. Those in favor of the motion vote aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. That, that motion passes seven aye and one no. Ms. Franks voted no. All right, now, Ms. Jachara had asked about the process and the timeline. And I will tell you that uh, Commissioner McCormack and myself, with some input from Executive Director Maxwell, have a proposal to share with you to, as just a point of discussion or a place to start discussion. And if you don't like any part of it, it won't hurt any, anybody's feelings. But on the other hand, it's a place for us to get this discussion going. So, um, Commissioner, do we have copies of that that we can we can share?
that. I would like to reiterate that this is in front of you as a as one proposed timeline, but by no means should you consider it fixed <coughs> or <coughs> unalterable. It's strictly to get this discussion going. Is 11-15 still the date that um, Ms. Maxwell's looking at to leave? Okay. May I email? I can stay longer, but that's the date. Yeah, that we can't hardly hear you. You need to get that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want that on the record anyway. Yeah. Uh, but I do have to give them, I have to give um, HR a date so that they can start processing the paperwork. And so, um, you know, I do have to have a date certain that I give them. So will you be here through any kind of transition? That's, I think, our goal is that I'll be here um, through a transition and hopefully a person would be in place that I could come to the November meeting and I could sort of go through one meeting with them and then, you know, do some transition instead of they're just having to come in cold and start from Because we're not selecting them till the November meeting. Yes, well, I guess then um, they would just jump right in then <laughs> well but will we not have a choice i mean will this commission only be given one candidate and said this is it take it or leave it or do you want uh, me to uh, let, me, let me let's go through this and tell you our thoughts they're only designed to get you thinking all right so what we did today was get the job description approved step one and now outlets to post i guess Brian, is that up to you with, you know, to send it to Arello, do what we send it to trade associations? We're working on, we were kind of working on a plan in terms of how the posting the outlets, I think we're, um, we're interested in, in, in doing a couple things, making sure we get the word out there to the right areas. And we've, um, Director Maxwell and I and Chairman Grease have been discussing that, and we've been kind of having those conversations internally based on what we've done for previous searches. Um, for other positions and I think we try to balance getting out getting it out there in an appropriate manner and then also um, you know making sure that we're not getting um, we're not trying to we're trying to give us a pool that's not going to be so excessive that we can't sort through so that's how we're planning the posting strategy let me just say just kind of outside this conversation the reason that it's just been myself and Commissioner and, and, and Director Maxwell is that dang sunshine law again. As soon as, if, if two of us talked about it, at that point, then we've got to notice it and it's open to the public. Okay, so at this point, we're just trying to get this organized. That's kind of the concept. It's not that we're trying to exclude anybody from the conversation. It's just the only easy way to do this that's legal without <coughs> having a public meeting. All right, so we get that done and you post the, post the jobs and that job posting is open according to this schedule till October 16th at which point we expect anybody that's interested in this job will have submitted a resume of some sort I assume to your office that's that's the concept all right now you see this on Monday the second I'm sorry October 2nd through Tuesday October 3rd I think that's a typo oops I'm sorry yep. Should be November. That's okay. Back up one step to Monday, uh, October nineteenth, through Friday, October thirtieth. You see this term screening committee. And this is what this this is what we visualize the screen committee looks like. It looks like me and Brian. <laughs> Only because we've got this issue with the sunshine log in, and yeah. if we have. 50 resumes that come in, I suspect we can eliminate the majority of those or find two or three gems in that group that submits. And this is how we're talking. I want you to know what we're thinking, and that's how we got to this point. So the screening committee <coughs> would, would involve, um, and if you said this is perfect, this is how it's going to work, would include Brian and myself. We would look through the resumes get it down to a certain number, let's say, I'm gonna make this number up, but say five of the 40 that came in look like viable possibilities. And at some point, we would talk to those five people by Skype or in person or whatever way it's necessary. And at some point, narrow that group down. And if you'll look, uh, 
Wednesday 11-4, you see a screening committee makes recommendation to an executive director search committee. So 11-4 is also the date of our November meeting. So under, in an ideal world, and if you all approve the schedule, on that date, it's possible we'll have one recommendation that's so outstanding compared to everybody else that submitted that this is who we recommend to you and we bring it to this committee, which is going to be two or three people perhaps, we haven't talked that far into it, but probably two or three people, who then would make a recommendation to the full committee. Now my sense is, frankly, if we're going to meet on November 4th, this um, um, executive director search committee, it's open to the public because there are going to be more than one commissioner. Mm -hmm. My sense is probably the whole commission will sit in on that committee. Might not get to vote, but they can at least sit, into it, sit, sit in that meeting because this committee is going to make a recommendation to the full commission in an ideal world on the same day. So that's what's in front of you. That's what we've come up with, and it's your turn to, to criticize it, add or delete. Brian, you want to say anything else before we go? Okay, just before y'all start the discussion. This, this, is, this timeline, this process that we've developed, and, and Chairman Grease and I and Director Maxwell did work on this process, and I think one of the goals that we tried to do here was to get um, – Director Maxwell is obviously – interested in, in stepping aside and we're trying to be respectful of her desire to retire. She's also committed to kind of help in this process. Um, so we tried to come up with what we felt like was the, the most efficient timeline that we could conduct a search in. And this, this actual timeline um, conforms very similarly to the, um, this is, I think I've told you, this is the third search I've been involved. If I didn't say this already, this is the third search I've been involved in this year. And this, um, timeline is very consistent particularly with the accountancy board search that just concluded um, and I, I would say that what we did in putting this together was based on sort of our uh, previous experience and these are all these searches were all done by boards that hire the executive director and we based that process very this is this tracks very similarly to the process that we used with the Motor Vehicle Commission the uh, Tennessee Board of Accountancy and that's kind of where that where that originated um, and so I think, uh, you know, you all haven't had an opportunity to meet their directors, but I think if you spoke to their boards, you would find that they have hired uh, two uh, really, really fine top tier uh, candidates in that process. So. All right, commissioners, floor is open. Ms. Hills. Um, <clears throat> I guess I would like, and I, I don't know where in the process and if it's that, that executive director Maxwell be able to add thoughts I mean who better knows the position so where would that be or where could that be so you want to address uh, that we and actually and I, I'll, I'll, I'll let Eve speak to this as well if she'd like we had we discussed this actually yesterday and um, I, I think most certainly would be glad to speak to her about input but I, I will say this process is pretty time-consuming and um, we really don't want to add that onto her plate as well. And I, 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 she's, I mean, you know Eve, if you ask her to do something, she will do it. But I, I think it would most certainly be the most respectful thing to not ask her to, to be a part of that process. And I think she would concur with that. If, I don't and, want to. And I feel confident in um, um, the chairman and um, the, the, the commissioner McCormick um, in making that decision <clears throat> because they know Eve so well. Um, and I, I think if it's left open where if you had questions, you could call her up and ask her if you had a question. It looks like a very tight schedule to me. I'm wondering if your job post, uh, your close your job postings on Friday the 16th, and then you screen people on that following Monday. Uh, I know you have to do background checks and th those sort of things. And I guess you can do them as they're, they're, they're coming in, uh, but I'm sure you will be doing background checks, and wh how, what length of time will that take? Well, as we kind of go through the process, and I, um, Caitlin Robbins is here with me. She works with me. She'll be helping manage the search from, from our administrative side, and I think what we'll be doing throughout the process is, um, and we've, we've, we've only kind of generally chairman Greece and I've only generally talked about this but what the plan would be that we would be taking a look at each week um, 
we would be reviewing the list start weeding out the process but as we start identifying candidates that we think are um, kind of more serious for the for that short list that we'll start uh, spinning during that week we'll we'll start looking into their backgrounds and as we start honing it down even more I mean I think we'll probably spend the most amount of time focusing on the small list in terms of background um, checks and and etc and um, you know I was thinking about this uh, to be funny sort of but I when I was uh, just to give you some help in my credentials as most of you all know I was involved in uh, when I work, I worked for the governor prior to this. I didn't get any any involvement with Mr. Wood or uh, Ms. Taylor, but I was involved in every single one of your all selections to this board. So I, if, I think that shows some good judgment. Looking that could me. not <laughs> necessarily <laughs> be good for you, Brian. <laughs> but uh, no, I think one. I mean, we'll, and that's kind of the plan is that we would really hone in on the on the on the background. I mean, we're not going to go through and do a deep dive on any candidate in that initial process. It's it's when we really start honing in who we think are the the final few candidates that we want to um, you know get in your all's consideration. I guess my biggest concern is um, that only one person is going to be brought to this board. Um, as a as a candidate, I mean, one person can interact greatly with you and with Brian, but you put them in here that has to interact with all of us, um, and that might not work out so well. Um, and you know, maybe they need a setting where they're having more than one person ask questions and well, I, I, I think we, we've tried to structure it that way so we might find two exceptional candidates or three exceptional candidates and at that point we would bring those three candidates to this um, executive director search committee so that that committee could ask those people questions if this goes on this timeline, I suspect there will be all kinds of commissioners in that committee meeting, even though maybe only three will vote, depending on what that committee looks like. Um, so I think you'll be able to ask questions, and you'll be able to vote up or down on when the final nomination comes before this commission. It's not if, if we get five votes and say, I don't like that recommendation that came from the executive director search committee, then we'll, we'll see what we can do in December. I, and I think we, we, we were not committed to bringing just one or three. I think we were, I mean, I think we were open to s submitting multiple candidates. I think we were going to see how the process, I mean, I think in the two experiences that I've dealt with, in one experience we brought multiple candidates to the board for interview, and in one experience we brought one, it was so clear. And I think everybody, everybody who was on the board, for instance, in the account, we knew when we got to that, one candidate we knew the board knew this person and we knew that this was someone that they were going to jump on board with so I think it's most likely going to be somewhere between one and multiple candidates I mean we wouldn't just bring you one if we didn't feel like that was um, that was exactly the right person so I, I wouldn't necessarily anticipate just one I mean we haven't I think we're our plan would be to most likely submit multiple candidates unless there was such an um, such an excellent candidate. I mean, I think that's kind of where we were coming from. Would it be more practical for the um, search committee, the executive director search committee, to meet on the third? You know, we've we've talked about that, and it may be. It, I think it again it depends on the number of quality candidates we want you to interview. I would I would kind of leave if as you're all making a decision in the process. I put the fourth on the we put the fourth on the the, the timeline here, but I would leave yourself some flexibility um, to determine the third or the fourth based on. I think if if it looks like I mean it, I think that may be a, a decision you're going to want to make down the road in terms of if if we're if we end up saying we're going to bring six candidates to your consideration. We just think there's six. You're probably going to want to spend it the day before. But if it's two or three, you know, it's it's it saves you all from having to come an additional day. I think that was kind of our thought. But I, I would I would recommend that you all leave that um, to the discretion of the chair uh, to to choose the third or the fourth. Mr. Chairman, um, could we get some legal advice about the Open Meeting Act requirements and the notice that would have to be given of that meeting, and would that impact? Um, whether 
you know, it would be on the third or the fourth and how long in advance we'd have to make that decision and give any kind of notice. Absolutely. And, and generally, I don't mean to step on Mallory's toes here. Uh, the Open Meeting Act just requires reasonable notice. And, and generally, uh, I think you would know almost certainly the month or a couple of weeks before. I wouldn't per, uh, expect that you would get so close, which, you know, if I were just making up numbers, you say under a week and you need to start making exceptional efforts to make sure that the public is notified. Um, but, you know, if you make that decision at the October meeting or, or two weeks in advance, uh, so long as you make, you know, the appropriate efforts to make sure the agenda is posted and that the associations are notified, I, I would expect that you would be fine in that instance. Uh, just to follow up on that, Mr. Driver, so there may be one or two people that really want to pick at this process, especially if they're not selected. How, how big an issue is that? Uh, Open Meetings Act and that time frame notice? Well, again, the, the only guidance given in the Open Meetings Act is that the notice has to be reasonable. And what the courts have said is that depends on the circumstances, which is why if I'm being vague, it's, it's by necessity, if nothing else. Um, certainly, uh, if we got into that situation, obviously, appropriate notice under the Sunshine Law is, is a imperative importance because if decisions made at a meeting that was required to be held under sunshine law and it has insufficient notice or no notice uh which i certainly wouldn't expect either of those then any decisions made at that meeting are void and of no effect and and certainly that would be harmful to the process but uh know that legals obviously working with you all and wor working closely with the assistant commissioner's office to make sure when those decisions are made that that we make sure to get the appropriate notice out in a timely manner because obviously we want the public to be aware of those meetings safe way to do it schedule a meeting the day before and then cancel it if we don't need it so at least it's been noticed well and the you don't want to do that too close to time either because you don't want people showing up to the meeting um and expecting to hear something discussed and then they show up and you say oh no that's being discussed tomorrow now and that equally puts uh, members of the public in a somewhat difficult uh situation if if at this point you think and i don't know the the administrative realities of the situation i guess my gut reaction is to say to go ahead and schedule it for the third to plan on revisiting the issue at the october meeting to see if you want to consolidate it at that time but to make sure that right now the process is is the one that people have better notice that that this earlier meetings a possibility based on the schedule we we won't know whether we need a meeting to maybe a day or two before the meeting the decision over whether to meet on the third the whether the executive director search committee meets on the third or the fourth be left up to that committee to make a decision um, on their own and then notice it out as needed? Well, the, the problem, of course, with that would be that the committee's discussion of when to meet would then create a new open meeting. Uh, so, well, but, I mean, obviously the safest way is to set the meeting at a certain time, whenever that is, and just have the meeting at that time. Uh, whether or not it's one candidate or, or multiple candidates, that, I mean, it would certainly be my. And, and, not, and, not, and I'm, I'm not trying to disagree with my legal counsel here. I just, I, I would say that we have, a, we have as a department have a good track record of making sure that meetings are publicly noticed in, a, in an appropriate time. I, I'm not aware of us being criticized for that. So I would say that we would make whatever efforts as we go through the process if you give the flexibility you're welcome to set the date i think if you're uncomfortable you can i would say with i feel totally confident that as an administration we would make sure that that this the third or the fourth is appropriately noticed because that's what i'm going to expect from our staff to make sure that happens for the board so i i don't particularly have any concerns about making sure but if you all want to set it that's fine if you don't um, we'll make sure it's set appropriately and noticed appropriately and I guess my concern with doing it that day is we're going to bring somebody in here and hopefully we'll have more than one candidate. I would hate to just bring one candidate here before this body. 
you're going to say, okay, we're recommending them for this job. Y'all got to vote on them or we got to start back from square one. Now they got to sit in on a full commission meeting. Um, I just think that's kind of <clears throat> crunching too much in on the fourth. I, I think at some point, though, that uh, we as commissioners have to make a decision over whether we're good with um, Chairman Grease and uh, Commissioner McCormack um, um, making that decision. I, I, I've been on three different um, um, selection processes with at our Board of Realtors, and we only, on all three occasions, only took one person to our uh, uh, Board of Directors. Uh, if they got voted down, then we started over, but that never happened. Um, so I have full confidence in them to, you know, I'm hoping it's one person. I'm hoping it's one person because I'm hoping that one person, the cream comes to the top and it's obvious who that person should be. I think if we bring in two or three, then it makes the job of this commission a whole lot harder. And they're bound by so many HR rules that it'll have to be done correctly. Other comments? Commissioner Bloom. Yes, I, I want to thank Commissioner McCormick for allowing our chairman to be involved in this process. I think that's very important. And I, I've never been involved in a selection of executive director, thankfully, because she's always been here while I've been here, but I didn't know how this is going to work. And my fear was that we were going to be mandated who that next person would be without input from the commission, so I'm very thankful that you've included John in this. Ms. Hills. So do, do you feel from your other experiences that, that there will be very qualified people to surface? I want you to predict and with your crystal <laughs> ball. What you got, Adam? Yeah, I mean, I, I expect that there will be. I mean, I, I, you know, it, having been through searches and look for positions it doesn't always sh shake out that way and that's one thing I did want to say this this timeline I feel very good that we can get a quality candidate through this process I feel very confident in that and I, I will say and I, I know I want to give Eve the opportunity to make a decision in terms of, of when she wants to retire and I don't want to push it for her sake farther back but I will say if we don't get if we don't get the right person in this process we're, we're not going to just say okay we're going to give up i mean i think we would retool the process to try to identify another candidate and i will tell you that there's we'll provide the administrative resources to help keep the um, commission moving forward but that gives us some time to in the midst of that i, I feel very i feel very confident i i would hate to say i can guarantee you with certainty that um, <clears throat> we'll have the right person here um, at the november meeting but i think the process does allow us the opportunity to find someone like that exactly what I was looking for um, uh, th that I wanted to hear that was on the same direction and with that I make a motion to accept this as proposed this Second. timeline oh, we have a commotion, uh, commotion a motion from Commissioner ah, Hills <laughs> we have a commotion too I think uh, seconded by Commissioner Franks that this uh, timeline as presented be adopted now is there discussion on the motion are we adding the 11-3 meeting to it? I, I don't think we were. I don't think we were. Um, Let's just plan on the fourth. Could be a long day. And go with one meeting. Okay. And John lives in Knoxville too. So I mean, this is. I appreciate his. Um, being the chairman and agreeing to do this. All those resumes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your empathy. <laughs> All right, is there further discussion on the motion, which is to adopt this timeline as presented? All right, let's vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. Mr. McCormack, um, I may have already told you this, but anytime we get anybody in front of us, they become wide open for other questions or comments somebody might have. Does anybody have any other topics or issues they'd like to speak to the assistant commissioner about? Well, I have a question for him. Are we getting anywhere on our ninth member of our commission? That's the public, is that the uh, other public member position? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just spoke with the governor's office. I know they're looking for someone. Um, I think it's, if I recall, it's an East 
Tennessee, and so I know they're looking. Um, it's they're pretty intently. As you can see, they took care of all the other appointments <laughs> here, but that um, one is is just taking them a little bit more time. I, I do anticipate that they'll have the final member. Um, I mean, I don't, I can't commit the governor to when he'll make an appointment, but I anticipate it'll be sometime shortly. How's that? <laughs> uh, other questions? So I'll just just throw one out there. So in, in Lee's resignation letter, she um, talked about how much he was having to work, which I got the impression was because her staff was short. Can, that's a short-term and long-term problem if we let it be. Can you just talk about that for a second? Yeah, we're, we're working through, um, we've, we've done, so we're, we're making some structural changes to the staff, the Real Estate Commission. We've been addressing um, we went through, we just recently went through a buyout process that is going to um, we've had a few folks take the buyout and we are um, those positions will actually be elevated to a higher classification when we have an opportunity to, to hire those positions it's taking a little bit of time to get those reclassified we've, um, and one of the one of the things that we're working toward is is getting a one of the things I think is really important is making sure that we have a very good and this is this is kind of I'll kind of speak broadly across the board what we're trying to do here in the division we are trying to identify to make sure that every single director executive director has a good day-to-day -day manager um, in that position and there's a there's a specific job title that it's I'm not to bore you with the titles but there's a specific title and we want that position to have at every program and right now we're working to get the real estate commission that position uh, for the director because we think it's really important to have a very solid it, it allows the director more flexibility to do the director type things and spend um, uh, time on some of the data that, that that are frankly time consuming and and um, we want to make sure that this director and I, I've taken a real keen interest in that position particularly in terms of their development in terms of making sure every program has it and in terms of the time spent in that process so I've I've included my the programs that haven't had a that position I have participated in in the the process of making sure um, they're getting a good person that position because I think that position is, is really vital um, we are moving to the new licensing system you, we happen to yesterday we turned off RBS and so I know you all have probably seen the early bird renewal notices and so I, I think you're going to be it's, it's going to take I mean as anything does taking a new system requires it's going to have some bumps in the road and it's going to require some some transition period but this process is going to I believe really revolutionize how we're doing uh, licensing it's it's done through workflows it's we went from DOS to window I mean to you know web-based I mean it I don't there wasn't really even a web and I mean there was but there wasn't really even a web when they started this program and so I think you're gonna see that really help with the productivity and I, I have personally taken a really you know even I have been talking about kind of making sure the program is is got the right resources and and I, and I I've, I've worked really closely with Eve to try to make sure we do that and and I um, and I can let Eve speak to this if she wants but I'll just tell you I'm very very committed to making sure that you will have the right staffing the right resources and and that the director that we bring in here would have the right support to achieve uh, the goals that, that that director would have thank you uh, other questions so let me follow up on that system that you said we've just put in place so a license a new licensee will they will their license be posted right now or is there a blackout period Like, I mean, the um, verify a license is not currently up because the system, the old system is in the process of migrating to the new system and then it has to be on board, the new system will be onboarded and it'll go live um, sometime next week. So in the interim time period, the, if you look up, say, a license on the internet, it will not have the most recent information because it, the information's not being input into the systems right now because neither one one's being shut down and has historical data and then the one that um, is currently coming on board is in the process of having this data moved over here and then have it tested to make sure that when it goes live next week that there are um, not major issues with it um, and they'll be great once it's up and running somebody trying to get started in real estate it's going to have to wait a week if 
Is that basically? That basically, it? right. They will. No, that's actually. I'm, I mean, I'm, we could send you, a letter out, but they, yeah. You could, st you can still um, apply for a license in this time frame. We we have we have encouraged. We have tried really hard to encourage people to uh, renew early. To um, you know, there. Are, you can. We just the system won't. Have, we'll be. We'll still be able to take intake information. Um, it's. License won't issue. I mean, like you, won't won't, get you won't get your printed. You won't get your printed you license. Your information you won't, in. You won't get. You, we have. We have. <clears throat> we have a letter that we've prepared. That legal's prepared. That would. That could go to an individual to identify you have been licensed. But as you, as you all know, the actual printed piece of paper does not. It's it's the fact that in our system that you have been licensed that that's the important factor. And so the 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 actual printed paper won't be able to be printed for the next uh, week. That system will. We'll go live on Wednesday. Ms. Hills. Good thing we made that policy yeah. adjustment. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm still trying to figure out if it's a new licensee, how long are we talking about before they can get? And so we got to, because the website's going to be down, they're going to get a letter. So how long should they expect to get a letter? The letter, um, the letter would not go out unless someone you know absolutely had to have that letter um but the we'll process their we'll we'll continue to like you can send your information in and we'll continue to work through the information that we get um and you can you know call our office and and see if the person's applications been, which is probably going to be the fastest way to do it probably need to call um, now. right because it, you won't be able to go online and check right <coughs> now so the fastest way to do it um, would be to call or email our office and that way we could um, see where it stands in the process since you all wouldn't be able to go online and look at that and see and the letter would just take a couple or three days to get there if in Memphis it would take seven to get there so it wouldn't be you know it would be much more expeditious to do one you know to contact us one way or the other so, thank you yeah. thank you Ms. Maxwell other questions all right Assistant Commissioner McCormack appreciate your input today thank you all so much for your time thank you Mr. Driver appreciate your input as well keep us legal all right uh, friends let's take a 10 minute break All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to pick back up on our agenda. Uh, we'd added an item Commissioner Bloom had uh, asked to discuss, and we will do that. But before we get to that, let me just, for the audience's sake, give you a little preview of some things to come today and tomorrow. There will be people that will appear before the commission this morning and this afternoon with their broker who've got some item in their history that might preclude them from getting a real estate license. And they're going to come before us and ask that we give them the authority to proceed to get the real estate license. And you'll see three or four different, maybe four different applicants today for that. This afternoon we'll have a legal report which is basically a report to us about complaints that have been filed against licensees and the responses from those licensees. Those complaints will be anonymous. We'll have no idea who they're about, what firms are involved in it, what town or part of the state the alleged complaint or incident occurred. And after each complaint, this commission will make a decision. The law department will always give us a recommendation. We can accept that recommendation, we can modify that recommendation, or we can make our own. And you'll see that happen, I suspect. It almost always does. But what I want you to know is once we, well, I'm going to make this up, but let's say there's a motion to offer the licensee a way to solve the issue and make it go away. And that offer might be to pay a $1,000 civil penalty and attend one of these meetings. The law department will take that offer to that licensee, and the licensee can say, okay, I'll do that, or no, I won't. I disagree with your findings, and they have every right to do that. Tomorrow morning, 
we're going to have a formal hearing where a licensee was offered a proposed settlement, and that licensee prop- said, no, I don't agree with it. She or he, whoever we have tomorrow, has every right to come before us in a formal setting. So my point, I think, is over the next day and a half, you're going to see from people trying to get a license to complaints being filed against license to people trying to protect what they believe is right. So that will all play as we go out the rest of this day and tomorrow. All right, back to the agenda. Commissioner Bloom, you asked for an item to be added to the agenda. Would you like to speak to the topic? Uh, yes, sir, I, and, and thank you for allowing me to put that on the agenda. I, I would like for our commission to consider, there's a lot of buzz about our rules changes, and I'd like for us to consider the possibility of creating, uh, uh, under Eve's guidance, the a, a PowerPoint that could be distributed to every board and association like Janet and I were involved in a, a session yesterday, and it was quite good. The legal counsel for TAR made presentation of the new rules, but she had her own opinions that she expressed, which uh, I, I'm fearful that every board and every association, as they present these rules to their members, there will be so many different opinions about what some things – I'd like for it to be a standard – kind of PowerPoint presentation we could provide, send it to all these boards. We have the money in our recovery fund to do that and permission to do that. But I'd just like for the commission to discuss whether or not that's valid. Mr. Chairman? Ms. Franks. Um, the, uh, the attorney for TAR gave a, a, um, a presentation at the Williamson County Association of Realtors that I attended. and. Um, I, I thought she did a pretty good job on it. Um, I, I, I think when there are commissioners sitting in the room, it makes her be a little bit more. Uh, she didn't give a lot of opinions uh, in Williamson County. And I asked at the end of the presentation uh, if she would send her PowerPoint to our executive director, and who in turn sent it to all the principal brokers in Williamson County. Uh, that wanted it, and uh, I have that, if that's a starting place, maybe for Eve to look at if if you think that would be appropriate. Did you see her PowerPoint? Yes. We did. Okay. So that they don't have to start from scratch, I guess, is my reasoning. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Other comments? So in, in that type of situation, the cost would be negligible, or is that a – simplistic statement on my part. Just time. Ms. Mullen? I was going to ask, um, what would the PowerPoint uh, say or look like? I mean, what would be included in it? I, having not been in the meetings, I just wasn't sure. The, the TAR PowerPoint included each of the individual um, uh, uh, new rules. But they weren't in legalese. Right. It was easier to understand. And I'm going to be using that at my office for an office meeting, and I'm sure lots of the other brokers are. Yes, I would just uh, maybe maybe Director Maxwell might speak to it. Just do we start getting ourselves in trouble if we start sending out, um, you know, additional commentary or analysis and, and that hasn't been actually approved by in, in the rules. And, and then if you cite somebody for something and, and then it's some close call between what your rule said and what you sent out in the PowerPoint, what happens then? Did she paraphrase the new rules? Is that what she did? I haven't seen her presentation. Yeah, she did. did she, she paraphrase it? She kind of had some of her own um, simplifications to the new rules. And, and what we could do is I'm, I'm happy to send that to you uh, this afternoon. Um, I, I don't know if, if the commission wants to look at that first. And I mean, it may be, I, I agree with Austin, that we could be getting ourselves into a can of worms and maybe it should come from TAR. Uh, certainly, from I mean, we want to help people from, understand what the rules right. are. But on the other hand, right. I don't want us to bind ourselves and whenever you cite somebody for something, they come in and they say, well, I had this PowerPoint that you all set out that said it was okay. And then we start looking at the PowerPoint and you find some little space where maybe it was different than the rule and then what happens and it could be well, a she, mess. She said that uh, Russ uh, Farrell, 
um, uh, helped her with it. So, I mean, there's two attorneys. So there you go. Well, there's a there's yeah, a well, problem. That, that T A R. I'm gonna out, get to you. Okay. You got to know it's true if they send. If it If they out. send it out and then we cite somebody and they come and they say, well, I was told by these people. At least they don't come in and say that we told them it right. was okay. Exactly. Well, right. maybe, maybe they gave you bad advice. But. Let me get to Commissioner Taylor first, and then we'll get to you, Malvi. Well, and, and look, I think it's better for it to come from us always and be come from Trek and have our legal counsel look at it before it goes out rather than some other body. Well, Kirby. I was just going to say that I think we have to be very careful about what we put out there because if it's a pair, even if it's a paraphrase of the rule, whether it's from one of their, the tar attorney or Russ Fair or even me, none of us are have the authority to interpret the rules only you guys do and so i think that it it's kind of walking on eggshells a little bit to put to basically put interpretations of rules out there without having specific cases coming in and looking at them on their own facts and then applying it to specific cases because like austin was saying once you put an interpretation out there it does not fare well for then to make when a case comes in front of you to make a decision that's contradictory to that. Well, and I, in the past, TAR and Trek have disagreed on the interpretation of the rules. So, well, you know, it, it, I, I think we'd have to be real careful about endorsing a seal on yeah. that. If a disclaimer went on there in some way, I think everything, anything we put out there needs to have some sort of a disclaimer. Well, uh, as Ms. Maxwell is, is fond of saying, I think you said this, that it's, it's not the role of Trek to interpret advertising or to approve, I mean, to approve advertising. Is that? That's correct. We cannot pre-approve any advertising. Um, we can just cite the statute and the rule. And I will do an updated, um, when we do the seminars in East Tennessee, uh, we'll, I'll do an updated PowerPoint that includes the new rules but they are written as they're written and then we talk about them if the commission's made any you know comments or made any decisions then I discuss those issues when I give the presentation so people know you know other than the statute and the rules they know at least what action has been taken official action has been taken by the commission um, and so we, yeah, we cannot pre-approve advertising that's the really the responsibility of the principal broker um, under Rule 1260-02-.12 to approve or disapprove any advertising prior to its dissemination. And we, we, we really worked on those rules and really tried hard to make that, that verbiage very clear, but uh, I, I think it would be impossible to make it clear to anyone. Uh, um, there were specific questions at our board meeting. Uh, it was mostly about the advertising and uh, social media. Um, well, can you do this or can you do that? And you know, it, it's it's basic. It's you know, you got to have your company name, you got to have your phone number, and, and and they were like, "What about Twitter? You can only." And I'm like, "Is that social media? So Twitter's included. At least that's how it stands right now. It's it, it's it's so many questions of how do I get around it? How do I get around all these things that we do? And really, it's pretty to me pretty clear." Uh, what the intent was of the commission on all of those rules. It's not that we came up with a lot of legal speak. I think they're, I think they're much more clear than the um, the rules that they will be replacing. The you know the 2010 rules. I think these new rules are much much more clear overall and certainly delineate a number of. Uh, specific items where questions had arisen in the past and where the Commission had realized that maybe they needed some more interpretation and some more guidance because um, if you remember they started out as guidelines and then uh, turned into rules as the two-year process went on but as I say I, you know we will incorporate those into the presentation um, with the seminars in the eastern part of the state and then back around to the other parts of the state as well but the next uh, seminars that we give except for the one in Jackson, um, will be in the eastern part of the state. Ms. Taylor. It seems to me that presentation that you're going to make might be a good thing to send out to other boards. 
We do. We have a um, like I have my presentation now. It's like fifty six pages, and we give that PowerPoint to every person who attends. But it does contain the rules. I mean, it, it it doesn't have a lot of commentary unless there was a particular decision, as I say, that was reached by our commission, or maybe a decision that we'd heard about at Arello or I'd read about in in you know some website that would you know just sort of show the thinking in general of you know the united states not necessarily tennessee but kind of give the idea of all right these things have happened so do be aware that these things are happening around the you know united states uh, but it uh, we do leave that presentation and we do leave the powerpoint for the uh, would it all, be all difficult to make that presentation available for every board no, i mean just the powerpoint part about the rules uh, no, I mean, we... we uh, well, I know you do when you make your presentation. Right. I'm saying, can we make that and send it out to every board it. ahead of October the 18th? So they've got... I mean, it won't be any interpretation. It's just the rules. Right. I haven't written... Um, I haven't updated it quite yet, but um, I'm going to before we go to East Tennessee. I'd like to be considered as a proactive association that's trying to help right. people understand this. Right. And I mean, and once I've updated out, I, I mean, I don't think there's a problem. So it just really has the, I mean, it has the laws and the, you know, and the rules, and that's really the primary parts of it. And it, you know, it's just arranged. It also talks about other parts of the statute as well. But I mean, I don't have a problem. I don't think there's a problem sending that out. Mallory can certainly look at it before th that time. Is there a, would there be an opposition to posting it somewhere where all licensees could access it, not just through a board? They don't do it. There's a problem. But she has a point. Not everyone's a member of a board. Or association or any entity that provides education. We could post it to the website send it to the I would schools. think it would be good to post it to the, have it a place on the website that you could go but I do feel like it's good to send it to the boards around the state so that they might have it and probably have we a could presentation. send it to the schools the schools use the information that really is available in this meeting and other places they use that as part of their curriculum I've noticed from time to time so I mean I think we could probably send it to the schools as well so that they would have it um, and then the boards would distribute it I mean so like they would just like we'd send them a copy and then they would distribute it or email them and they would distribute it as as would the schools because we do want the schools teaching the most current information so at, at this point we've just had discussion is um, is there a motion or further discussion about this that you'd like to follow up with <coughs> Ms. Kirby I'd like to suggest can I look into it a little bit over the break and get back to you in the afternoon and make sure we don't have any other concerns with it I say you can <laughs> okay I don't hear anybody saying you can't all right thank you Mr. Bloom we'll get back to this topic after lunch I think we won't have a break until lunch. Can I just cl clarify with one question? Yes. Are we? Is this? If it is, if it's Ms. Maxwell's presentation that she's, it's being sent out. Is am I understanding correctly that there will not be a cost involved in distributing it? It's going to be emailed, I suspect, right? Okay. Okay. May I bring up something else? Is it sure can, time Ms. for us to get <laughs> a new book here that's printed up so that we can look at the rules and regulations and know what they are in one place? Mr. McCormack, do you want to speak to that book for a second? I know you didn't mean to hang around, but you did for some reason. So, <laughs> Every one of us have asked that question. <laughs> TAR is publishing one. So I think one of the things that we're – we're working on and and I I'll say but this this resource is a very very costly resource the books I think as you know are um, the expense uh, director Maxwell and I were just talking about it before this conversation started it's a very very costly um, resource and it's the amount of time and I'm trying to use my words carefully here the amount of time that it's accurate each year is um, it's it's updated a pretty significant time after the laws and rules go into effect and they often become outdated very quickly the website um, does have all the electronic rules and we're actually working as a department with um, customer focused government and and Mallory has been involved in some efforts to make the rules um, 
more accessible in terms of the, how they're how they're how they're arranged for for um, kind of from an online perspective and and it, the ability to get the information is is going to be available online in a way that's um, going to be very strongly that you all would would continue to um, encourage licensees to access it through that that manner because that it, when when that online source is is and, and it is available currently but when we get a really um, more appropriately tailored I think more user friendly option it, that that information that a person accesses is will most certainly on on the online um, portal will be accurate there is no question that that information is accurate as the books float around there's updates it's um, it's not as accurate, and, and, th and this this process is going to be for certain. You'll know that's where the option is. It'll be accurate, and it is going to save licensees a significant amount of money not to produce the books. So, do you do you have an estimate of when that? Well, I'm not sure when everything's supposed to be done. I when I met with them yesterday, I think I remember something about. In the next couple of months, they want to get at least something going, and I, I believe that they're starting with. You all are we're the, the first. You're, this 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 program is the. I mean, the, and this is a, this is a this is a statewide. They're looking at this statewide, and so you are the the primary focus of this process in terms of trying to tailor a good resource for you um, to make sure that it's very user friendly. It, it, I, I used it Sunday night, and it was not user friendly. I know, and I, I could have shot myself. I and was at home without my amendments and my green book. And yeah. It was not good. When I met with the technicians yesterday, I was very clear to them that this needs to be something that the average licensee or consumer can look at and find the law they need and be able to understand it. And so I, I addressed the formatting issue with them, um, how it needed to be organized. Um, and and they seemed to understand what I was saying because they themselves are not lawyers either. And so they, which is why they wanted my help because they were looking at it and saying, we don't understand how we can organize this. And so that was something I met with them to try to, to just uh, address from the beginning was that so that it would be something that anybody could look at and, and access what they needed. It was my understanding that there will be on the tn.gov page, a, a place where you can go and access all Tennessee state law. And then there will also be links um, for just our specific real estate laws on the real estate page as well. So there will be a couple different places you can access the laws. And I was just going to reiterate, the goal is to make it as user. I mean, the department is very committed to getting a good, up-to-date resource that's user-friendly online that saves licensees. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to licensees in an efficient manner. Oh, you didn't say this, but the state's not going to print this book again. I, I would I would say it's fair to say we, we don't plan to print this book, yes. But, but there'll be a printable version from, is what we have been told in the past. Online. Online, no, correct. yes. Okay. Correct. Could the uh, updated laws from the website be downloaded onto our pads that we use during the meeting so that we could have them to look at? instead of using the book if it's outdated during yeah. the meetings if we're making decisions about cases and stuff they, they yeah we i mean the pocket part is the updated part and in, then in the new um the whole updated rules are in there uh we could um i guess we could download that part of the, the statute I don't, I don't see why that would be a problem yeah, i feel I like that's that. something we could work out yeah yeah uh, other questions, Mr. Taylor? Are you satisfied as best you can be on this answer? I'm a little bum puzzled. Bum puzzled. <laughs> what does bum puzzle mean when you're no. in Memphis? No, I think it's great as, as long as I know that something's being done to give it to us in a good format that we can find and easily access. That's great. That's Mr. McCormack's representation. So far, everything he's told me has been true. <laughs> Thank you all. Well, thank you, thank sir. Thank you. All right. We're now on the agenda where we've got, if everybody shows up, three informal appearances, informal applicant appearances. And assuming those three 
uh, groups of people are here, the process works like this. We would like the broker and the potential licensee to come up to these two chairs. There are two microphones right here. Ms. Kirby will ask you to tell the truth. You'll say whether you will or not. At which point, Ms. Maxwell will read into the record a narrative that I believe she has created explaining what's up. Once that narrative is done, we'll ask the licensee to say in his or her own words what they would like to tell us. Fill in the blanks. Make us like you if that's what you're trying to do. Following the licensee, your potential licensee, then the broker will get to tell us why they think that licensee might be a good fit for his or her company. And at some point, someone will make a motion up here that will say, I move that we allow this licensee or applicant to go forward or someone will make a motion that says, I don't think it's appropriate at this time, so I say, let's not. So that's where we're going. The first couple up is Charles E. Fowler with his proposed principal broker, Allison Oaks. Mr. Um, Fowler, if you'll take this. I don't care. You can see if you like that chair better, you can sit there. <laughs> if you just raise your right hand and repeat after me. Do you, both of us, yeah. Both of you. Sorry. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Maxwell. Yes. Uh, the applicant is Charles E. Fowler. He's applying for an affiliate broker license. The principal broker is Allison L. Oaks, who is the principal broker of Platinum Real Estate Services, LLC, DBA Platinum Realty Group, which is located in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, Ms. Oaks was first licensed as an affiliate broker on 513 of 1999. She was first licensed as a broker on 717 of 2008 and became the principal broker of the newly licensed Platinum Realty Group at that time. The track records reflect that the Platinum Realty Group currently has four affiliate brokers, no brokers, and one principal broker. Ms. Oaks has had no disciplinary action taken against her by the commission. The applicant, Charles E. Fowler, submitted an application for decision regarding criminal conviction and an application for licensure. He has taken and passed the real estate exams and completed the 90 hours of pre-licensing education. He has revealed the following. On 10-11 of 1999, Mr. Fowler was convicted in Buncombe County Superior Court, Asheville, North Carolina, of hit and run a felony. For the felony conviction, Mr. Fowler was sentenced to two years in confinement and five years of probation and restitution of $214. Mr. Fowler stated that he was 23 years old and on his way to work and was involved in, involved in a rear-end accident in which he hit the back of another person's car. He states that he stopped, gave the person's information, asked the person if she was okay. The driver said yes, so Mr. Fowler continued on to work. According to Mr. Fowler, when the police arrived after he had left, the driver said she was injured and apparently that Mr. Fowler drove off. This incident resulted in the hit-and-run felony conviction. Although Mr. Fowler did not realize at the time of the incident that his actions would result in a felony conviction, he does take full responsibility for the decision he made at that time. Mr. Fowler has since been involved in a number of businesses and has had no other convictions that appeared on his TBI-FBI report. If the commission approves him to move forward in the licensure process, Mr. Fowler intends to complete the requirements for his affiliate broker license. Just one clarification. The, the written narrative had 1993, and you stated 1999. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the written narrative was correct. My eyes were not correct, I guess. <laughs> 1993. All right. Thanks, Ms. Maxwell. All right, Mr. Fowler, welcome. We're glad you're here. To tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, the incident, anything you'd like for us to know. Okay. Um, yeah, the incident was in 93. Um, it, was, uh, it was a situation where I had... Uh, we were stopped at a yield sign, and I was second in line, and the woman in front of me thought she had enough space to go, and I did too. If she went, I was going to go, and then she decided not to, which is, you know, she didn't feel safe doing it, and I didn't know. I was still looking to make sure I had room, so I bumped her. I got out. I uh, checked with her to make sure she was okay, and sh she was a little upset with me. I guess I didn't put that in the report, and uh, 
I had uh, she didn't have any damage to her car, and in my opinion, she wasn't hurt. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, two weeks later, the police came and arrested me, and I, to be honest, I had no idea what was happening. I was 23, um, but it was complete. The accident itself was my fault, and I was just with a misunderstanding with the woman because you know we obviously weren't getting along. But um, right now, I'm in a transition to moving to Tennessee. Uh, with my girlfriend in Maryville. Uh, she actually is a uh, associate broker with Miss Oaks. Um, I've been involved with real estate for a while in North Carolina. Um, I have, uh, or just the buying, and uh, I'm a landlord out there. I own some and run some apartments. Um, in the transition over here, I, my passion is real estate, and I'm, I spend probably hours a day looking up on Zillow and whatnot uh, and helping friends out with real estate and I figure it was a natural fit if I came over here to work alongside Miss Oaks and my girlfriend. I had questions for Mr. Fowler. Are, are you licensed in what was the, the state you live North in? North Carolina. Are you licensed in North Carolina? No ma'am. Okay, and tell us a little bit about your property management business that you do in in. Uh, it's not a property management business. I own some apartments out there. For yourself only? For myself. Okay. Where is that in North Carolina? It's in Cullowee. Uh, it's west of Asheville. You, um, it says you were sentenced to two years in confinement. How long did you actually serve? I did not go to Okay, jail. it was just uh, the probation? Yes, sir. Okay. The questions for Mr. Fowler. All right, Ms. Oaks, glad you're here as well. Why do you want this guy? Well, uh, and a humorous statement to get him off Zillow and onto the MLS. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, who hasn't done something in their past when they were 19? He's um, went through all the steps, which has surpassed, you know, getting his license, the education. Uh, the diligence and paperwork that we all love um, you know he already owns property and rents them and he still has a passion to keep dealing with the public which is lovely um, Michaela who is his girlfriend um, she's stellar I mean rock hard solid fantastic person um, in my business loyalty is pretty much superior to anything else and I think that above all else, he'll be loyal to his clients and just be very ethical in his decision making and provide all the real estate services he needs. And his paperwork so far has been perfect. You know, it's led us to here. Um, I, I have no problem standing behind him and giving him my support and letting him sell as much as he cares to sell in East Tennessee. Hi, right, Commissioners. Questions for Ms. Oaks. Could you tell us a little bit about his training process? Um, to this point, we haven't done anything. No, I mean, if he, when he's licensed. Um, well, I'm very type A. There isn't a formal training or process. Um, I'm hands-on. I, I have very few agents under me. Um, my phone lives under my pillow, so if any time he needs a question answered, I'm almost 100% available. Um, and with the processes through all the, we're at Knoxville Association of Realtors, and they have probably second to none in our state of education. I mean, we give free education at our association in volumes. I mean, if, if you want to learn, there is a place and a time almost available every week to learn. You know, you just have, you have those venues. He has me at his disposal. There's various other agents in my office that, you know, if I were bleeding in a ditch, you know, they would be more than happy to come over and answer any questions, but I can't imagine that they would need to go to that extreme. But it's just, you know, step by step, as needed, very thoroughly described, any questions and answers. It's kind of just how I operate. You know, as needed basis, um, I seem to conduct business above board and ethical, and I, I reciprocate other agents who do the same, and I respect that, and 
hopefully that will be mirrored upon my agents. Other questions? Mr. Chairman, I move to approve this applicant. Second. Motion by Commissioner Frank, seconded by Commissioner McMullen, that Mr. Fowler be allowed to proceed to get his real estate license. Now, is there discussion on that motion? I hear none. Let's vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. Good luck to you guys. Be safe heading back. A lot of trucks out there today. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right, next up is Khalif Rashid and Cheryl Muhammad. All right, Ms. Kirby, if you'll see if these guys will tell the truth. Raise your right hand, repeat after me, please. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Ms. Maxwell. Yes. Um, Mr. Khalif Ab Abdul Rashid has applied for a principal broker's license. His, uh, his a broker's li an affiliate broker's license. I'm sorry. His principal broker is Cheryl A. Muhammad. Uh, she is the principal broker of Assured Real Estate Services, uh, which is located in Memphis, Tennessee. Miss Muhammad was first licensed as an affiliate broker on 12 21 1999 and first licensed as a broker on 12 16 2004 and became the principal broker of Assured Real Estate Services on 2 3 of 2005. That firm currently has three affiliate brokers, no brokers, and one principal broker. Uh, Miss Muhammad signed and satisfied the terms of a consent order on 9 16 2014 that was issued by this commission. Uh, the applicant, Mr. Rashid, submitted an application for decision regarding criminal convictions and an application for licensure. He has taken and passed the real estate exams and has completed the 90 hours of pre-licensing courses. He revealed the following. On 12-17 of 1993, Mr. Rashid was convicted in the Circuit Court of Cook County, Illinois, of possession with intent to deliver a, a controlled substance, which is a felony. For the felony conviction, Mr. Rashid was sentenced to nine years in confinement. He was in confinement from 12 17 of 1993, was released from custody on 1 14 1997, and discharged from parole, mandatory supervision, and had his rights restored on 1 19 of 2000. Mr. Rashid states that this was an isolated incident and it is the only conviction on his TBI FBI report. Mr. Rashid has related that his family broke apart when he was in high school, drugs were all around his neighborhood, but that he had remained focused on school and playing basketball. When he was 21 years old, his mother moved out of state, his father had been addicted to drugs and was gone, and he and his younger brother were left to live with family and friends. At the time, Mr. Rashid said that he had a job as a line cook, but the pay was not sufficient to provide a place where he and his younger brother could live on their own. On the day he was arrested, he was approached by someone in his neighborhood who asked if he would deliver a package for $500. Mr. Rashid states that he made a bad decision and agreed to deliver the package. The person who gave him the package to deliver was a multi-convicted informant. Mr. Rashid was arrested and convicted uh, at that time. Mr. Rashid admits that he knew immediately that the package contained drugs and that what he was doing was wrong, but rationalized that he would only do it for this one time. He has taken full responsibility for the decision he made that day and his work to overcome the obstacles the felony conviction has created. He received his BA in 2002, is married, raising his children, and has been gainfully employed since his release from confinement. If he, the commission approves him to move forward in the process, Mr. Rashid intends to complete the licensure requirements for affiliate broker. Thank you, Ms. Maxwell. Welcome, Mr. Rashid. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. I hope you are. Uh, would you like to, uh, in your own words, restate what you've just read or give us information about yourself that we'd like to know? She said, this, I caught the case. Actually, I got the case, and it was uh, the, the incident happened January 14th. I'm going to interrupt you for one second. If you will talk clearly in that microphone, okay. we, some of us can't hear as well as we used to. I don't there. know if it's the, the, light, cause the light is going on. You're okay. Okay. Yeah, the incident actually happened January the 14th. I was actually convicted uh, December the 17th. I had just turned 23 four days prior, and as she said, I was in a 
a very more than just financial hardship. I was my family had been torn up. My sister were gone. It was it's even bringing emotions to me now just reliving this. It was a very emotional time, and I I was in very dire need of a financial uh, thing as she stated. And I knew I was for a long time I escaped the, the perils of drug selling and all of that. And, I, and not to, you know none to, not to say that I didn't stay around it because it was all around me. So this particular guy, he wasn't necessarily a friend, but I knew him, and I'm not, I wasn't naive that I didn't know that what it was, but I, I felt like I wasn't particularly a drug dealer. I was just going to hand him the package, get my money, and, and be done with that and find a place for me and my brother to live, but it didn't work out like that. He wound up being an informant, and he was going around the neighborhood, you know, just getting anybody that was willing to do that. So, And after, the, after that, excuse me, after my release, I, I went to University of Memphis. I got my B.A., and then I went to the master's program, which also, because of my conviction, stopped me from being an educator. So I, I worked for 15 years at a company called Park and Hanoff, and it was a pretty decent job, but I also knew that I wanted to do something with the public. I wanted to, you know, influence people in some kind of way that I can keep them from doing what I was doing or help people in some kind of way, and my job wasn't it. So I decided to strike, strike out on some entrepreneurial endeav endeavors, and that's what led me to real estate. And so and I know if I'm given this opportunity, I'm a person of integrity regardless of the conviction. That was a one-time event. I like to tell people all the time, in my particular situation, it's not like I'm changing my life around. It's more like me reverting back to what I was really originally on, which was education. My situation and my circumstances caused me to make a, a very poor decision at one time. And ever since then, I've, it's, it's woken me. It's waking, you know, it's, it's definitely woke me up. So since then, I've been straight and narrow and trying to stay focused on what it is I, I think I put on earth to do, and that's help people and teach them any kind of way I can in any, any subject that I can. And also, right now, I'm, uh, like I said, I'm trying to be a real estate uh, invest, I mean, agent. I have several entrepreneurial endeavors. I have a basketball program of like eight children that I supervise. And I have six kids that I supervise. And I was also uh, asked to write something, excuse me, asked to write something that uh, shows that what I'm gonna, how I'm going to stay out of jail. At this point, it's not like trying to avoid jail. I'm trying to avoid for hell. <laughs> I'm trying to have a good character. It's, it's, my character is not based on trying to avoid, you know, the jail system. It's just being good to people. So, I mean, I, I've done my time, and, and like I say, even even in jail, I knew I wasn't that person. So. But, you know, things happen, and I took full responsibility for what I did. All right, Commissioner's questions. Where did you say you worked in Memphis, and what kind of business is that? I worked, since I've been, my release, I've had two jobs since I've been in Memphis. The first job was Chesapeake Display and Packaging, and the, the last job I worked was Parker Hannafin. What is that company? Uh, we deal with PTA, PTOs, power takeoffs. We put, they go on uh, dump trucks, and any truck that has any kind of hydraulic function. <laughs> mm -hmm. Other questions. So th this uh, this incident was in Chicago. How'd you get from Chicago down to Memphis? And my mother had moved when while me and my brother were caught. I was incarcerated. My brother, my mother moved to California, then to her hometown in West Memphis, and I wanted to escape. That's another uh, thing that I did to ensure that I would never go into that situation again. I uprooted myself into Memphis so that I wouldn't have any. You know, I can, I can now, from this point on, from that point on, I can select friends that fit what I was, you know, the lifestyle that I was now choosing. And I also did the same for my children. I had to make sure that they were in the neighborhood where those influences weren't around. So, it's, you know, it's, it's, it takes a village to raise a child, and I want to be in a proper village. So I left Chicago. I want to follow up on that. You say you have six children. Mm -hmm. So how, how tough a job is it to keep those kids in the right area with the right people? Actually, coming from my background, it's quite easy. <laughs> seriously, seriously, coming from my background, because when I walked out my door, it's, 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 I mean, it's literally like Beirut. But where, they, where I'm staying at now in Memphis, it's, I'll give you a quick story. I was, I was just sitting in my garage one day, and a guy was riding by on his bike, and it just, it just dawned on me, the, the neighborhood and how my kids are growing up so different from me, and I thank God for that. So, you know, I did everything I could for myself and my family to avoid any kind of, you know, perils of that nature. Okay, other questions for Mr. Rashid. If not, Ms. Muhammad, why, why are you interested in this fella? 
I think he would be a great fit for Assured Real Estate because, for one thing, he's a great communicator. He's good with people. Since I met him, I've been, you know, trying to see how he handled people, how he handled himself, and he handled himself good. And I think he's a trustworthy person. You know, he never lied to me that I know of, but <laughs> he's never lied. He's going to be great, and I know I'm going to be responsible for him. That's why I have in place a mentoring program. He has to do two sales and two listings with me. But I won't release him unless I feel comfortable. If he has to be, I have to be a mentor for him for a year, then so be it. Because I want to know exactly what he's saying to the clients and how he deals with them. But I, I think he's going to be great. I'm not going to have any problems out of him. All right, questions for the principal broker. Mr. Bloom. Well, I had several questions written down here for Mr. Rashid, but they must have been written in invisible ink because they're all gone after I heard <laughs> him talk. I would like to recommend that he move forward in this process and be approved by this commission. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Bloom, seconded by Commissioner Dechara that Mr. Rashid's um, desire to move forward in the real estate profession be allowed to occur, for, for lack of saying it a different way. <laughs> All right, is there a discussion on the motion? As a new commissioner, it's one thing to read it, but to hear it is it's different. And, you know, and, and if this thing goes well, and if I ever hear bad things about you, I will be so disappointed in you after how you've just spoke to us, so. Yeah. I don't hear that. Okay. Well, as we had a commissioner one time, this was directed at Ms. Muhammad, but basically says if he comes back, you come back. And, and it sounds to me like you're not interested in coming back. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. If you're all through, let's vote on the motion. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. Good luck, guys. To good, both luck, you. Uh, good luck, you. Good luck. Ms. Maxwell, yes. before we get to this next um, applicant, would you explain how they get here? What what causes this to these people, and why do we have to interview them? Sure. <laughs> I know you're a short term or all that. I'm that's right. Yeah. So uh, you don't work her like a workhorse. That's right. Yeah. So I'm trying to clear my mind of um, all this. Uh, no, there's um, on every application for licensure, there is what we refer to affectionately as question five. And question five um, says, have you ever pled guilty, pled no low contendere, or been convicted of any criminal offense? Uh, do not include traffic violations. And um, if someone answers yes to that, or it shows up on their TBI, FBI report that we get back um, from the fingerprints that have been given, then that individual um, has to get us court paperwork and we try to verify exactly what occurred with um, the items that they disclosed or the items that appeared on their FBI TBI report. And if it turns out that an individual has a felony or a misdemeanor that involves the theft of money, services, or property, then that person, along with their principal broker, has to appear before the commission because the statute in 6213.303 requires that everyone who, to whom a license is issued, um, let's see if I can find my, ah, see, thank you. Uh, the qualifications require that licenses be only granted to persons who bear a good reputation for honesty, trustworthiness, integrity, and competence to transact the business of a broker or affiliate broker or timeshare salesperson in a manner to safeguard the interest of the public and only after satisfactory proof of such qualifications has been presented to the commission. So by coming in with the principal broker, those individuals who have felonies or misdemeanors that involve the theft of money, services, or property can come before the commission, and the commission can then make a determination that they do or do not fit those qualifications that are required by the statute. And that's, uh, that's the reason why certain individuals come in and certain individuals, you know, are able to clear whatever was on, say, their TBI, FBI report. If you had a DUI that was a misdemeanor, then you wouldn't have to appear before the commission at that at a meeting. 
Did that explain it? That was very good, Ms. Maxwell. Thank you very much. I hope we recorded that. <laughs> All right. For uh, future reference. Next on the agenda is uh, Shelton Young, accompanied by Charles Anderson. Gentlemen, if you, you got here a little bit late, but if you'll let our law director swear you in, then see, both of you have a seat, each in front of a microphone. You can raise your right hand and repeat after me. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. And before Ms. Maxwell reads this in the record, who is Mr. Young? Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, Shelton Justin Young is applying for an affiliate broker license, and he's here with his principal broker, Charles Allen Anderson. Uh, Mr. Anderson is the principal broker of Signature Properties, which is located in Kingsport, Tennessee. Mr. Anderson was first licensed as an affiliate broker on 10-22-2002 and is a broker on 6-15 of 2007. The records indicate that he has been a PB off and on since he was licensed as a broker and became the principal broker of Signature Properties on 8-15 of 2013. The firm was first licensed on 3-7 of 2011. Uh, the TREC records reflect that Signature Property currently has 23 affiliate brokers, five brokers, and one principal broker. Mr. Anderson has had no disciplinary action taken against him by the Commission. Shelton Justin Young submitted an application for licensure. He has taken and passed the affiliate broker national and state real estate exams and has completed the 90 hours of pre-licensing courses. He revealed the following. On 1-31 of 2012, he was convicted in the General Sessions Criminal Court of Sullivan County, Tennessee of theft under $500, a misdemeanor, and aggravated criminal trespass, a misdemeanor. Mr. Young pled guilty to the misdemeanors and received a sentence of 11 months, 29 days, had to attend theft counseling, perform community service, and make restitution. Mr. Young states that he made a poor judgment decision which resulted in the misdemeanor convictions and that he has completed all terms of his sentence and moved past the incident. Over the last few years, Mr. Young has worked for his brother's plumbing and remodeling business, initially helping it to get started and then to build it build its reputation. In 2 of 2015, Mr. Young took the opportunity to work with his stepmother in the real estate profession, performing assistant coordinator duties, and now Mr. Young would like to get his license so he can continue to grow his skills and knowledge while working as an affiliate broker. If he's approved, he will uh, move on in the licensure process to complete the requirements for licensure. Thank you, Ms. Maxwell. Uh, Mr. Young, welcome. Glad you're here. Would you uh, like to uh, Fill in some details, give us a little bit more information about yourself or anything you think might be helpful to your case. Well, it was just a poor decision one night I made. There was a backpack laying on my car and Did said, you just a, Speak right in there. It's just a poor decision I had made. One night I had came out of my friend's apartment, and there was a backpack on the back of my car. Instead of figuring out whose it was, I just took it in, sold the school book, and got in trouble for it. And it was just a stupid decision. and. I've learned from it, and I'm, I'm just nervous. I'm sorry. I don't, I'm not good at this thing. <laughs> well, you have every right to be nervous. This is a pretty imposing body up mm -hmm. here. <laughs> Anyhow, just relax. And um, Is that all you want to say? And Are you prepared to take some questions? I'd rather take questions. I'm not good <laughs> okay, at talking that's what about it myself. <laughs> Mr. McMullen, do you have? Yeah. Um, hey there. My name is Austin McMullen. Welcome. Um, could you maybe, uh, I, I would like to know a little bit more about what happened in this incident. You you talk about the, there was a, a backpack on the, your car or something yes, like that. Could you just explain a little bit more what happened? Well, I was at my friend's apartment. I came out that night and when I went to leave, the backpack was on the back of my car. I asked him if it was his, he didn't know, so I put it inside. I'm sorry, you slow down just a little bit. I couldn't understand that last part. You said you came out to the car. Yes. Okay, just try to slow down just a little okay. bit so I can understand. And um, the backpack was sitting on my trunk. I didn't know whose it was, and it was like 2 in the morning. So I went in and asked him if it was his, and it wasn't. So I put it in my car because I didn't know what else to do with it. And then the next day there was a school book, and I just decided to sell it back to the school, which is not good. And then... Um, I was caught because I used my license to sell it back. And then the rest is pretty much the sentencing and everything. So there was a, in the backpack, there was a, a textbook? Yes, sir. And you 
took that to the school bookstore and sold it. Yes, sir. And that was the what was the crime, That's, I guess. Yes. Yeah, because you sold that book and it really wasn't yours. Yes. Okay. And do you have any understanding? I understand the theft under five hundred dollars, and then it says aggravated criminal trespass. Well, you have any understanding about what the, how that's different? Well, the trespassing it was pretty much a, it wasn't my property, and um, the man whose book it was tried to say I would broke into his car to get it, which was not true. So they charged me with trespassing instead of burglary because there was no way to no evidence of that happening. What? And so since the conviction. Did you did you actually serve any time incarceration or was it just probation? It's probation. Okay, and then since then you were working at your brother's plumbing company for a while. Sure. Okay, and then you went to work for this real estate company. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. The questions for Mr. Young. All right, let's go to Mr. Anderson. Tell us what you know about this fella and why you're interested. In having him with you. His stepmother works with our company. She's been in real estate for 23 years, a successful realtor, um, Sharon Young. And um, his dad actually owns a home inspection company. It's well respected, Mark Young with Premier Home Inspection. Met Justin for uh, the first time in February when Sharon brought him in to assist her with some of her paperwork since she'd been so busy. Um, right off the bat, I mean, with his, he just has high energy and excitement and he's got a great personality. I approached him and asked him, why don't you pursue the real estate career? Um, Sharon was, I mean, very excited. She would love to see him do it because she's hoping in the next few years to retire. <clears throat> and which I, said, I think it says a lot for Justin that she would like for him to carry on the business that she's built. And so he came in once I talked with him about this, and he discussed this with me and told me he wanted to know if it was going to be a problem. So, uh, and I told him no. <laughs> Didn't think it would be a big problem, but. <clears throat> uh, questions for Mr. Anderson? Well, will he be a part of a team uh, with his stepmother, or, and, and also is she a, uh, a broker? Not a broker. Um, he will be working with her. I mean, she's there. They will be, I guess, a team in a, in a sense. I don't know that they'll classify, but who will be doing his training for the most part? We have a training program of signature properties that all new hires are required. It's about a 12 week training program. Um, so we have that. And do, of course, with his, I can tell you his stepmother. You check one of her files, it's there. Um, she's meticulous with her. Help her with her paperwork. So he's already familiar with a lot of it. But, you know, I'll be checking the files and um, I'll have close watch with him. Young, can you work with your stepmother okay? Oh, yeah, we get along great. I love it right so now. Far. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, I, actually, I guess it was about a year ago. He came in the office one day, and I was even at that point, I I didn't know him, and I asked her, and you know, at that point, she's like, "He's a great kid." Speaks very highly of him, so. All right, members of the commission. If, if, uh, I make a motion we approve Mr. Young to move forward. Second. Motion by Commissioner Dechara, second by Commissioner Frank, said um, Shelton Justin Young be allowed to continue on to his goal to become a licensee in the state of Tennessee. Is there a discussion on the motion? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I, I would just like to make a statement sure. before we vote. Um, Mr. Young, uh, there are a couple of things that I look at whenever I'm trying to decide whether to let somebody go forward in a situation like what you're what you've had and, and there have been two that have been up here before you and now you're the third one and a couple of things that i look at are how long ago did this happen 
And how serious was the thing that happened? And does it involve something like um, taking somebody else's property or, or an issue of trustworthiness and things like that? So the first two that we looked at were not as much of a concern to me because they were like 20 something years ago. Um, yours is more, your situation concerns me more because it was only three years ago and it was a theft issue. Now it was a very small item, it's under $500. Um, and the facts as you've explained them to us kind of provide an explanation about what happened. So I'm not real concerned that you're gonna leave here and, and steal something else. Um, but I wanna let you know that to me, this yours is the closest call out of the three that we've seen this morning. I just want you, I want you to understand that your integrity is the most important thing that you have. And you're gonna be put in situations where you're gonna have control over client money and, and money that belongs to other people. And you have to act in the highest and utmost honest way when you're dealing in that situation. Because any, any question about what happens is probably gonna be answered against you oh, yeah. as somebody who's got somebody else's money. So you have to be absolutely careful in everything that you do and be absolutely honest and trustworthy and maintain your integrity. So we're giving you a chance here to go forward with this and the fact that you're gonna be working with your family, I think is, is another factor that in my mind is in your favor because I'm hoping that they're going to keep a really close eye on you. I think they will, they will. and they're not going to let you screw up again. Oh, but no. don't don't screw up again. Oh, I promise okay? I will not. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McMullen. Well stated. All right, I think we're ready to vote. If you're in favor of the motion, please vote aye. Aye. If you're opposed, vote no. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, Mr. Young, Mr. Anderson, good luck to both of you. I need to ask you a quick question. What's a reasonable length of time to drive from Kingsport to here? <laughs> you could ask Miss Hills. What do you say, Miss Hills? What's a reasonable amount of time to drive there? I was very safe in arriving <laughs> with two stops in four hours. So a We're four hours is not reasonable, I don't think, <laughs> especially if there are two stops. So I just want to get this. We're her. not real sure what she's, uh, her mode of transportation is when she comes, if it's a helicopter or Room. just exactly yeah. what. And, and they use the word uh, reasonable. Yes. <laughs> yes I, I had right. it. I had it. I had, I had a tailwind. Uh, <laughs> all right, gentlemen, have a safe trip back. Thanks for coming Thank down. You. Good luck to you. Good luck. All right, let's move on to the education report. Mr. Ross White is here to give that report to us. Let me find it on my iPad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Good morning. Good morning. I want to uh, submit to you to the September 2nd education agenda and report. Um, there are several courses, providers, and instructors that had to be reviewed this month. So I would like to submit to you that I have reviewed those courses and providers for your approval. Um, I, and they are under S1 through S32 in your agenda. I would submit those for your approval this morning. All right, commissioners, you've heard the report of the uh, education director. He recommends we approve S1 through S32. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Vichara, seconded by Commissioner Hills, that the courses S1 through S32 be a discussion. What, what is the name of the provider in the S1? Um, that's CARE, the Real Estate Learning Center. That's Aquanetta Harris. What's the first word? Well, it's CARE plus ER. That's my 
uh, reading of it. Error plus error. Or error. So this is not the core class that she, when you first came on, I right. was given that, okay. This is a distance course, Commissioner, and she had um, submitted it here this last month. I'd like to recuse myself from this vote, Mr. Chairman. Like the fourth provider is G Wiz Real Estate School. I mean, <laughs> that is correct, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Just curious. I mean, we don't take that into account when we make a recommendation. <laughs> the G Wiz. <laughs> All right, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to recuse myself from just S1. I got it. Okay. okay. Any other comments or questions before we vote? All right, let's vote then. The motion is to approve S1 through S32. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Let the record reflect that Commissioner Franks uh, recused herself on S1. Affirmative for the balance of the courses. Thank you. All right, Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. And continuing on under S1 through S32, there are a number of instructors who need approval. I would submit that I've reviewed those and that they are uh, properly before you for submission. Had Brian Copeland not been approved by this commission prior? I had, I could not find him in the system, but that's not. <laughs> okay. He's been teaching a long time. Yeah, he's <laughs> a CRS instructor as well. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bloom, seconded by Commissioner McMullen, that these instructors be approved uh, per the recommendation of our education director. We got that shady one on um, S21. S21. Yeah, I saw that one. Who is it? Let's call him out. Randy Thomas. Uh, <laughs> I'll speak for him. I like him. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All right. Any other discussion? You've heard the motion. Please vote. If you're in favor, vote aye. Aye. Uh, Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. What else, Mr. White, do you have for us today? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. We're going to take a Trek seminar on the road. I think you'll hear more about that from, from uh, Ms. Maxwell, but I believe that we'll be continuing on in October. At, uh, at, well, the end of September, we're going to be in Kingsport with NITAR, and we'll look forward to that and, and seeing Commissioner Hills there. Um, and then the commission meeting is right on the heels of that, so we'll be there for two or three days uh, in, in Kingsport. Uh, and then moving on to October, uh, we plan on uh, attending a, and, and uh, putting on a seminar at Jenner, um, at, I'm sorry, for uh, at CAR, that's the Knoxville Association of Realtors, and for the Chattanooga uh, Association of Realtors. So we'll be at three locations in East Tennessee coming up in the next six weeks. Jenner is a town. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I misspoke. It was not Jenner. It was, that's actually the, the Nashville Association, but I, I was thinking Oh, Gnar. About, okay, that's where it's, okay. Yeah. I'm, I wasn't hearing you good. <laughs> I think he's sorry about that. too. <laughs> we just call that G-N-A-R. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, Ms. Maxwell, could, would you be prepared to start on your report? This week. The first item on my report uh, really dealt with um, Commissioner Bloom's question. So that uh, so unless there's other reason to talk about the Education Recovery Fund, it, I thought that um, that was related more to Commissioner Bloom's question that we discussed earlier um, about the you know the resources and so anyway so. It, I have no, I had nothing further to say um, about that particular issue. So then we'll move to the licensing statistics. Uh, as of August 31st, 2015, um, our total number of licensees in that are um, affiliate brokers, brokers, and timeshare salespersons is 34,342. And of those, 25,975 are active licensees. 1,009 are inactive licensees, 6,395 are retired, uh, 376 are broker release, but 
all of those broker release people have E and O insurance, which used to not be the case. And then there's still 487 individuals who are suspended. Um, you can see if you look across the historical data that our retired numbers have um, really decreased significantly. Say even from 2010, we had 10,462 individuals who are retired compared to the 6,395 that we have um, right now that are retired. We do see more and more individuals who allow their licenses to um, expire out of that retired state. And we, I, I don't know whether or not we're just hitting a particular period in time where maybe some of those individuals who had licenses that were in retirement have either aged out or just decided that they are really have been retired for a while and are no longer in the business. A number of these people have, um, in fact, been retired for a long time that are not renewing their licenses. So our numbers there really um, have the most significant decrease. Uh, if you look at firms, we have um, as of 831.15, we have 3,811 firms and 148 retired firms for a total of 3,959 firms. Uh, our firm numbers, uh, as far as applications, have picked up a little bit as the whole business becomes more active, obviously. And uh, then if we move several pages and go back to applications approved and exams taken, which is maybe page four, two, three, four, page four, um, you'll see in um, August of this year, there were 382 applications that were approved, and there were 573 exams that were taken. So the exam numbers have, uh, July there were only 483 exams taken, so the exams have um, picked up quite a bit over um, the month before, which usually happens. It seems like the summer is sort of a dead time, and then it, towards the start of school, things pick back up. People um, get back active and um, decide they want to get into the real estate business. Um, our average per month of applications approved is 335 year-to-date, and the average um, exams taken is 532 uh, so far this year. Uh, and then the next page breaks down the exams by license type. You can see that um, during this most recent period of time, um, we've had uh, three acquisition agents that have taken the exam, 533 affiliate brokers, 53 brokers, and 36 timeshare salespeople for a total of 625. That really should say 8-1-2015 to 8-31-2015. Um, and you can see how this time last year we had 510 total um, exams taken. Um, let's see, I'm just trying to hit the highlights here. Uh, the total licenses issued, and that's two more pages back, um, we've had um, 277 affiliate brokers license issued, 34 brokers, four non-resident uh, licensees, 16 firms, 13 timeshare, five vacation lodging, and no designated agents. So the vacation lodging services must have already had um, their designated agents in place for a total license issuance of 349. Uh, and then um, our total of all the licensees that we have, and uh, we have 10 professions that we regulate uh, it's that our largest profession is the one that includes the brokers and the affiliate brokers and the timeshare salespeople. And then we have the firms that we regulate, the real estate firms we regulate. We regulate um, rental location agents and rental location firms, of which we have no active ones at the current time. Um, we regulate timeshare developers, the Wyndhams and the Marriotts, who are actually the large developer of the timeshares. We regulate vacation lodging services, which, as you recall, is actually an exemption to our act, um, to the Broker Act, but we have a uh, small amount of regulation that we have over those. Those are services that um, are involved in the management and operation and rental of a cabin or a residence of a third party that is for a transient period of time, which is deemed to be two weeks or less. So those are very short-term rentals. 
uh, and we regulate those. We regulate the designated agent that those firms have to have um, affiliated with them. And then we, read, uh, we license uh, acquisition agents, and that's part of the timeshare umbrella, as it were. And the acquisition agents, um, we regula regulate two types of those, but the primary type is the uh, group of people that if you're walking down the street or at the beach that approach you and they don't sell you anything, but they want you to come on to the property of the timeshare sales uh, people and then you know look at the development and then the timeshare sales people take it over once you're on the property. So the acquisition agents acquire the people to go onto the property actually. And then um, we also regulate two other types, acquisition, uh, we have re registration of acquisition agents also and acquisition representatives, and those um, are people who do not live in the state and do not have any, um, they don't have an offering in the state, they don't have a property in the state, but they send literature, like they'll send mailings or they'll, you know, they only contact you by mail, and that you pay $25 for and you get a lifetime license in that. So it's sort of a different kind of animal, and we really don't have very many of those anymore. Those were much more popular, I guess, back way back in the day, because we, we never appeared to have very many of those. And so that's, so we regulate all of those professions, which is to say that in all of those professions, we have 40,115 uh, licensees at the current time. Uh, and then, um, our renewal percentage, uh, and these are individuals who have, this is based on uh, individuals who have not renewed their license by the 61st day after expiration. Everyone's license obviously expires on their expiration date, but the statute provides for a renewal period, which is the first 60 days following expiration. Um, and then you fall into reinstatement, which the commission's familiar with that. Um, and so during that renewal period, you can renew with just paying a penalty fee that's provided for in the statute. So on the 61st day, we consider those people to be in a reinstatement period, and so they then are counted as not renewing, and it's our percentage that we do. And right now, um, our average for the last 12 months is 16% of the individuals who are eligible to renew have not renewed their license. Um, and you can see that, that the last two months, we, our non-renewal rate have been 20% and 35%. So um, the renewals that would have expired, you know, gone the 60-day period at the end of Jul June, 35% of those people have not renewed. And that's not to say they won't come back and reinstate. Um, or they won't retest and reapply. It's just that they didn't renew in that what would be that 60-day renewal period. Uh, but as I said, there's no grace period really. It, your license expires when it expires and you don't have a license to practice at that time. This is just the way the statute's crafted, if that's clear. And uh, so that's, uh, unless there are questions on the statistics, um, I mean, I'm Hills happy has a question. Okay. So, so the privilege tax, do you think that has anything to do with this being larger than um, in the past? You know, I don't, this, the 35%, uh, do, uh, Betsy keeps track of those percentages, and she did go on vacation on the 20th, and she did, I mean, she has remarked over the past three or four weeks how high, they hit some really high numbers. Sometimes that's just because we, have staggered licenses and our licensees renew every single day. You sometimes do hit a clump where you have just for whatever reasons, a lot of people who might have um, just fallen onto the same week or day that they and they didn't renew their licenses. The privilege tax, um, they haven't they haven't put a hold on any of them for this year for two six two fifteen. Um, we still are obviously clearing the ones from 214. We have probably, um, right now, I don't have the list with me, but we probably have 30, maybe 30 people who have met the requirements to renew and that they've paid their money, they've got their CE, they have, you know, whatever they needed to renew, but they have not cleared their privilege tax. And so those people, there are probably about 30 of those right now, but every day, 
you know, there may be someone else who gets onto that list because they're then renewing. And, you know, we have people who won't, that hold won't hit them till 216 when they go to renew because they renewed in 214 right before November when that hold was put into place. And they will put another hold on this year. It's just they're trying to make sure that um, all the agencies are, are working off the same page of what what letter we're supposed to get and what we need to release the individuals, um, particularly where their payment plans involved. Uh, you know, some of these people owed three and four and five years of back taxes, of back privilege tax, and so that mounted up. You know, that went from 500 whatever. You know, most of them were like 583 dollars with the interest and penalties for one year, and some of those zoomed up to two and three thousand dollars, which was a significant amount. So a number of those individuals elected to pay in payment. I mean, they were revenue allowed them to pay in payment plans. Um, but so that and that, you know, is uh, we still we can still release them as long as we have the information from the revenue. All right. Other questions about the statistics? Well, Ms. Maxwell, I think we're going to interrupt your Can report. I ask one oh, yes, sir, Mr. Wood. I'll ask one question. I don't know how to really which one it is, but it talks about individual licensees uh -huh. lost gains for the year. Right. And if I'm just kind of looking at the bottom numbers, is that meaning there's only 200 more agents now than there are this time last year? Well, if you look, um, if you look at the um, front page in the where it's probably easier to tell, um, you know, if you look at the very first page where it says. It compares um, 83115 to 83114. Okay. You can see that our change from 14 to 15, we are at an overall decrease of 2,852, and the largest, you know, the largest amount of that decrease is attributable to people who were retired and no longer, you know, they're out of retirement. They expired, um, and so you see that active from last year, we have a plus 950. If you're on the first Right. Page right, and so you can see we have a plus 950 on active, and a plus 245 on inactive, which you know is a statutory state that we place you in if you haven't met your um, educational requirements to retire, and then you'll see that that big decrease in retired individuals, and so that seems to have had the that that for a period of time has had a significant increase. But they could go from retired to active or? They could, could but a no. lot of them are rolling off and going to expire. They're just expiring. Okay. All right. Not every single one of them, because you're right. Some of them, I mean, you know, there's a constant, there's just okay. this constant movement of uh, Trek One forms. We, you know, there's just a constant. Sometimes we'll get um, 1,500 Trek One forms in a month. You know, just people are busy doing believe that. It. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break for lunch. We'll be back at 1 o'clock. There's no reason for you to sign out or to sign back in, but you will need to sign out at the end of the day. So 1 o'clock, please be back. All right. Um, <clears throat> Steve, what do you say we finish up your report before we get to these next informal applicant appearances? Okay. That sounds good. Let me gather my things back in the right order here. Uh, the next, I finished the, stati the statistics, um, unless there were any other questions on those. The next uh, topic on my report is the seminars, and um, Ross touched briefly on those just to give you the dates of the next ones. Um, NETAR, the Northeast Tennessee Association of Realtors, uh, is scheduled for the day before our meeting up there on 930 of 15 when, is when the seminar is scheduled from 1230 to 330 right now. Um, and so we'll have one seminar there. We uh, are tentatively scheduled to go to the Knoxville Association of Realtors on 1019 and to the greater Chattanooga area of Realtors probably on 1028, right? Uh, from one to four. We also, Ross and I are going to meet with the Better Business Bureau here locally about timeshares, really more the resale scams that we've talked about before. Uh, they are pretty, they kind of go, um, come and go, but right now they're pretty rampant. And as the commission knows, in order to sell um, resale timeshare interest, generally speaking, you have to have an affiliate broker license, a firm, a principal broker, and um, 
the most of these people aren't licensed at all and actually don't even exist at the addresses which they list on their um, websites and they have pretty extensive websites they get people to wire large sums of money thirty forty thousand dollars to um, theoretically to transfer their timeshares and the transfer never takes place as I say, a lot. One of them was a parking lot in down, just a parking lot in downtown Nashville. Um, a couple of them have just been warehouses. I mean, they're just they use just any address. It's not a legitimate address. So um, Ross and I are going to meet with them just to discuss that. Hopefully, before I leave, I'll be able to get the timeshare sort of pattern that I um, chart that I have started for you all. Um, so that you can kind of have that to look at and sort of see the structure of the timeshares because I know at times they're a little bit confusing. And the resales really are the most egregious thing that um, goes on because the individuals do wire money to places where they and they never see it again. And we, um, the few that the few addresses that are here that are legitimate, the people, uh, the individuals involved really are just transferring pieces of paper and they're not in, engaged in that or we can't find even with sending the auditors up there we couldn't find where they were engaged in the sale to a third party all they were doing was simply like a title company would do and that is transferring paperwork so um, that it's a it's a pretty challenging situation and I'm sure at Arello uh, Ms. DeCharo and Ms. Hills will hear some additional information about that and Ms. Franks I forgot sorry um, and I think you know it's, it is challenging for every state but anyway that's um, we're going to meet with them as well and then uh, Ahmad and I are going to Jackson, um, Tennessee on 1020 to give a seminar just on property management, <laughs> which we are in the process of writing. Uh, and uh, I, they had a lot of questions in Jackson um, when we gave our seminar there on property management. And so um, Ahmad's going to go into a little more detail about the accounting that's involved in it and maybe some – really it's just going to be better, better or best business practices because – our statute, neither the statute nor the law, um, the rules govern exactly how the accounting should be done. It just says that you have to maintain the records and it doesn't tell you how they should be maintained. So any information that we give uh, will really be best business practices as far as that goes. And then we'll discuss the um, rules and the statute and I guess have many questions <laughs> asked judging from the seminar. And that's an update on the seminars if there are any questions about those. And we'll incorporate the new rules into these. Uh, one other thing about the, the, this is not the seminars, but it's kind of under the same heading. Uh, Commissioner Grease had, uh, Chairman Grease had mentioned several months ago that it might be beneficial for the commissioners to have some, I don't know, lists of frequently asked questions that mainly that you all get asked as opposed to us. And I'll be happy to do that, you know, write up some answers, but I would need the questions that you all get asked <laughs> fairly frequently. I mean, I know that, that Chairman Grease gets phone calls, and probably all of you all get phone calls from time to time about specific things, um, like reinstatement or, you know, things that are, are, are you know, they're, they're pretty black and white. It's not like something that's a really gray area, like what do you think about my advertising, but, you know, more of a specific issue. And I'm happy to write that up or write answers to those things. Um, if you all have questions that you feel like are asked fairly commonly. Um, and I'm sure that Commissioner Taylor and Commissioner Wood will be asked questions because they always seem to call new people and ask them a lot of questions as well. So I just want to you know, put that out there. I'm happy to do that um, before I leave. Uh, the next thing, are there any questions about any of that? The next thing um, is an E&O update and just a brief update on the E&O. Um, we still have 435 individuals who were suspended originally for failure to provide proof of E&O on 113 of 2015. Um, and so those people, they've been contacted. They haven't taken any action. And as we've mentioned before, judging from the last suspension that took place on 7, uh, the last big suspension on 7-1 of 13, and like probably 90 percent of those people were revoked on 7-1 of 14. So we haven't had um, a lot of people that pay the penalty fees that are required under the statute. We have had since 225 of 15, $17,000 paid pursuant to the penalty fees in the statute. And that's the um, that's everyone who's paid to clear themselves. And two of those uh, were suspended from the earlier time 
and one was someone who had been revoked from the earlier suspension. Uh, and so that's, um, that's where we stand on E and O. Are there any questions on that? So the next um, thing is the complaint report. And the, um, I made some little charts, but the little charts didn't um, put the numbers in all that well. But we, anyway, we've, um, this sort of shows what complaints we've had and the rule or statute to which they relate. And you can see that we've, um, the commissions had a total of 562 actions taken. And so this is not the number necessarily of the complaints. It's the number of like the rule violations. So, you know, some complaints might have two or three violations. So, you know, that's not, this is not the number of complaints. This is the number of, you know, rule violations that have existed in the decisions that have been made um, by the commission. The commission actually heard 482 complaints from 7-1 of 2014 to 6-30 of 2015. So this is like the annual, um, that's last year's, last fiscal year's information um, gathered together. And you can see that, um, you can see the, the listing on the breakdown there of what these graphs represent. And then the circle shows you, on um, the circle graph shows you how many violations were found under those particular rules and statutes so that you see that um, that say under unlicensed there were 20 violations found under unlicensed activity um, and then the 6213312b I've, I have a sheet of paper that I can send you all that breaks that down into its integral parts, but that's that whole statute on discipline that uh, you frequently find, uh, you know, violations of that. So that's why that's such a large number. And then the 6213-400 series, as it were, where there were 40 violations, those are the agent, primarily the agency and duty, reasonable skill and care, good faith and honesty. So it, it's, um, you know, 403, 404. And as I say, I had this broken down into a graph that I didn't um, put on the iPads because I just finished it this morning. But anyway, it, so that's, so this, um, you know, this gives you a sort of an idea of, again, where the violations have been. And, um, you know, this is what the commission has found at the probable cause hearings. I have on my graph, I do have how much money that the commission had um, authorized to be put in the consent orders, but that's not indicative of what it had been, what's been paid, because some people, as Commissioner, as Chairman Grease mentioned earlier, some people don't pay their consent orders and choose to go to a formal hearing. Um, and last year there were seven revocations of license, not counting E and O, but there were seven revocations that were either the result of someone's failure to uh, report that within 60 days that they had been convicted of a felony that fell within the um, terms and conditions of the statute or misdemeanor as well that did. Uh, and then there were six other revocations that the commission made the decision to revoke either asking the person to voluntarily agree to revo revocation or to they revoked it in a hearing. Um, and so I I can answer any questions about this, and as I say, I can send you all the breakdown because it'll be a little easier to see the rule breakdown. Just on a graph, it, there, some of them just there's so many of them that just have like one violation that it it makes it sort of difficult to see much of any contrast with that. Um, and you can see that the monies that um, we collected in August it was forty thousand four hundred and seventy dollars, sixteen thousand eight fifty of that uh, were in statement fees. And uh, consent orders were twenty thousand five hundred and seventy dollars of that, uh, and so that's uh, an agreed orders two fifty and agreed citations twelve hundred. Are there any questions about any of this? Would you like me to send you the breakdown of that? <laughs> okay, I'm happy to do. Have that. all that memorized, and we don't. <laughs> that's right. Well, as I say, just some of them, you know, like 212, I mean, 312 has 20 little sec subsections under B, and it just, the, you know, there's some that just have one or none. Um, so I will do that. The uh, fingerprints are the next item, and just to update you on the fingerprints, 
Um, the number of applicants that were fingerprinted from 8 1 to 8 31 this past month was 312. Um, of those, 50 had an indication, 251 had no indication, and 10 had no read or were pending. So that just means that either they didn't, their fingerprints didn't take, or for some reason when they're running the prints, they're just taking a little longer to come the, back on our report when the TBI and FBI are running the um, prints. The indication figures remain about the um, same percentage. Uh, indication meaning that you came back with some sort of incident uh, with law enforcement. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have to appear. It just means that you had an incident with law enforcement that we have to resolve one way or the other if it's not listed on there. Those to us. Could you send the the charts as well? Because sure. those would be good graphics to use in the core class. Yeah, I'll I'll be happy to send those. You know, I like those charts. Yes. So this this is just just about my every month question, but you you somewhere in here is a, an exhibit of people who agreed to the citation offer. The disciplinary action report reflects basically the people that have. Well, that have agreed, paid, you know, done the, I mean, like they've paid and agreed. And uh, they're not, you know, but it's not, in the, you have 30 days from the date it's received, correct? That's correct. So it doesn't always run exactly on the month that, you know, it would reflect like this month maybe you gave this number of decisions and you had that many people that would show up on the disciplinary action report. But the disciplinary action report does reflect individuals who were disciplined and signed the consent order so <clears throat> here's my my question is where is this where can where can the public or where can other licensees find this it's on the um department of commerce and insurance site there's a link there on the um main site which is actually where you go where everyone goes now initially is to the main site and there's a link there and I guess the link says DAR report uh, it used to say DAR report uh, I mean a disciplinary action report um, and it's listed there and it does list all the boards so when you go to it you see all 30 regulatory boards or 29 30 regulatory boards so you have to scroll down and find real estate and it did have this yeah it is at the bottom <laughs> And it is. It did have historical data. I don't know if they've taken the historical data off. It used to have historical data. We used to have a link off um, off of our site to just our disciplinary action report, and we had to remove that. And it so it would be. It has to be in the big report. And that's the same answer you give me each time I ask, right? I know it, it is the same answer I give you every time. It hasn't changed. <laughs> Maybe it will one day, but it hasn't changed of yet. Uh, the, so the next um, item is the budget. I don't know if there are any questions about the budget. The year-end budget, as I said last month, we'll probably get those numbers um, in October. <coughs> that that's usually when we usually get the final fiscal year-end budget. So that would cover seven one of 2014 to six thirty 2015. Um, this is the budget for um, this is the the but these are the budget numbers I should say for um, the month of August for the month of July so um, it covers that period of time so that's that, that concludes, concludes your report it concludes my report it does indeed any questions for Miss Maxwell before we move on all right then let's move on um, we have two informal applicant appearances scheduled for this afternoon. The first is Darren Ebriola. Is that, did I say it correctly? Yes. Thank you. And his principal broker, proposed principal broker, Lawrence Lippman. <clears throat> Gentlemen, if you'll come up, find a chair at this front counter with a microphone in front of it. But before you sit down, our law director would like to make sure you're going to tell the truth. Can you raise your right hand and repeat after me? Is the test do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, thank you. So now Ms. Maxwell is going to read into the record her summary of what's in front of us. Uh, Darren Lee Abriola 
is an applicant for an affiliate broker license. His principal broker is Lawrence M. Lippman, uh, license number 3673. Mr. Lippman is the uh, principal broker at Lippman RE Inc., DBA, the Lippman Group. Is it Sotheby's? Sotheby's. Um, International, and that firm number is 3671. Uh, Mr. Lippman has been the um, principal broker of Lippman Group since 5 1972 and that was the date the firm was first issued a license. This firm is located in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Mr. Lipman was first licensed as an affiliate broker sometime prior to 5-22-1972. I have to say that our records didn't pick up his, his initial date of licensure, so I, he probably knows what it is, but I couldn't. I um, didn't know it was that long. <laughs> yeah, that was when you, that was what we could first find in the, that's what I could first find in going through all our records. Um, and he was first licensed as a broker uh, on that same day, so I know that he was licensed as an affiliate prior to that time. Uh, the track records reflect that the Lippman Group currently has 36 affiliate brokers, seven brokers, and one principal broker. Uh, Mr. Lippman has had no disciplinary action taken against him by the commission. Darren Lee Abriola submitted an application for decision regarding criminal convictions and an application for licensure. He has taken and passed the real estate exams and completed the 90 hours of pre-licensing courses. He revealed the following. On 3-31-1987, Mr. Abriola was convicted in the General Sessions Criminal Court of Davidson County of concealing stolen property, a misdemeanor. For the misdemeanor conviction, Mr. Abriola was sentenced to 90 days in confinement with all but five days suspended. On 12-12-2013, Mr. Abriola was convicted in the Criminal Court of Davidson County of aggravated criminal trespass, which was a misdemeanor. Mr. Abriola pleaded guilty to the misdemeanor and received a sentence of 11 months and 29 days with all but 30 days to be served on supervised probation. He was discharged from probation on 12-18 of 2014. Mr. Abriola states that the concealing stolen property conviction arose from a traffic stop for drinking and driving. The police searched his car and found a plastic light that one of Mr. Abriola's friends had left in the car, which was marked property of CSX Railroad, and he was convicted of stealing stolen, concealing stolen property. Uh, Mr. Abriola says this incident occurred when he was in college and was drinking heavily. The criminal trespass convention, conviction was the result of a domestic situation, according to Mr. Abriola. Uh, Mr. Abriola accepts responsibility for all of his actions which resulted in these convictions and knows that he made some bad decisions. He no longer drinks and has held management positions at several major corporations, most recently for ECAT services. Uh, he has states that he's matured and makes better decisions now and plans to move forward in the licensure process if approved for his affiliate broker license. All right, Mr. Abriella, you've, you've heard the summary, but we'd yes. like for you to fill in the blanks. Okay, yes, tell, sir. tell us about yourself. And um, uh, as Ms. Maxwell stated, uh, I was 1987. I was very young. Uh, I was doing what I guess young people do I was you know drinking quite a bit um, and like I said I got pulled over for drinking and driving and the police officer went tore the car apart looking for whatever and uh, they found the plastic light I, you know I had I mean I had friends shoes in my car and books I mean you know when you're that young you know folks leave, leave stuff in there and somebody left a light in there and I, I I honestly didn't even know it was in there, but I mean, you know, I had to take responsibility for it because of my car. So, um, you know, since then, um, like uh, Mrs. Maxwell stated, you know, I've I've gone through many background checks for different, very large companies. I've never had any any issues with being fired or a asked to be resign uh, to resign. Um, you know, I've definitely you know turned my life around. I've you know. Uh, my, my sense is, or guess is, this commission would rather hear about the most recent event, not the previous, not the first event, the, the criminal trespass. Uh, the criminal trespassing had to do with an ex-girlfriend. Uh, I uh, went to her house to retrieve some of my belongings, and she um, called the police on me and uh, said I was trying to, you know, uh, break into the house, but that it wasn't true, and I ended up with a misdemeanor trespassing commissioners questions Ms. Ms. When, when was that uh, 
uh, I believe two years ago. 12, 12 of 2000, the conviction actually was 12, 12 of 2013. <clears throat> okay. And you don't, you don't mention that in your letter to the board members? That one was totally left out and I was just wondering why. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't recall. I'm sorry, I apologize. I have thought that we were focusing yeah. primarily on the theft because the and misdemeanor involved in the theft of money services. Are that, that's what yeah, I was no, told by no. Mrs. Uh, Kimberly Smith said that the reason that I needed to come before the board was be, but specifically because of the uh, the uh, possession of stolen property from 1987. Mr. Kirby, is that correct? Do we need to take into account this aggravated criminal trespass issue? It was a misdemeanor? Yes, ma'am. I mean, it doesn't really have anything to do with property or any of the things denoted in the statute, so I would think probably not. Oh, I, like I said before, uh, um, Mrs. Smith, uh, I asked her, you know, why I was denied for the license, and she specifically said that ap after Mrs. Maxwell reviewed my record that it was A, specific to the possession of the plastic light from 1987. All right, Mr. Lippman, will you tell us a little bit about yourself, your company, and why you'd like to have this gentleman affiliated with you? What would you like to know about my company? Uh, well, just what is it? Tell us about your oh, company. Oh, okay. The name of the company is the Lippman Group Sotheby's International Realty. I'm the principal broker. Sometime in the 70s, and I've never been before you all before or had any problems or any situations. As far as Darren is concerned, we have checked him out with somebody that we know very well, and his name is Al Davis, who used to be, y'all may know who he is, he used to be with Fox Ridge, he owned it, uh, a building company, and he's well respected, and he's watched this young man grow up and felt like that he was on the straight and narrow and would do a good job. And at the same way, and we'd like to see him get a license. All right, commissioner's question is for Mr. Lippman. What kind of training program do you have? Lippman, if you'll move closer. I'm sorry, it's a mentoring program. Um, my managing broker is sitting behind me. Her name is Gloria Exum. And between us and a few of the agents, then we will help him learn along with us and basically see how we operate. And he's doing it on the job rather than in How do you know Al da Davis? <coughs> uh -huh. uh, I, I grew up with all of his children he's known me since I was in kindergarten um, he's known my parents for 50 plus years uh, um, I, I grew I basically grew up with their family so uh. Miss Hills Mr. Littman and how long have have, um, have you known this gentleman now I barely know him okay but you know you get like that somebody deserves a, whether they were guilty or not, a second oh, well, Your principal broker is here. Has she interviewed this gentleman? Uh, my managing broker. And, a managing I'm, broker. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm okay. not sure I'm what the difference broker. is. It, we yeah, recognize yes. managing broker. She has spent yeah. more time with him than I have. Would you like to ask her a question or two? Commissioners? Yes, please. You get to be sworn in too now. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Thank you. Tell us your name, please. Yes, sir. My name is Gloria Exum. And how long have you been uh, had an acquaintance with this gentleman? 
Well, um, I actually have interviewed and met Darren on three different occasions, had many conversations with him over the phone since he first approached us to talk with us about applying um, and putting a, a new license with us. Uh, I did want to share with you, I've been an affiliate since 1986, and I've had a broker since 2008. And um, I actually worked for Day Al Davis for 10 years. Yeah, you have a high regard for Mr. Davis. I do. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions for Ms. Exum? All right, is uh, Commissioner prepared to make a motion? I make a motion, we approve. Second. I have, I have a motion by Mr. Chara, seconded by with Commissioner Woods, Commissioner Wood, excuse me, Wood. <laughs> that um, <coughs> Mr. Abriola will be allowed to continue on in this process of getting his real estate license in Tennessee. Is there discussion on the motion? All right, let's, let's try a voice, voice vote. If you're in favor of that motion, please vote aye. Uh, if you're opposed, vote no. All right, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate your time. Thank Good you very much. Good luck to all of you. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, next up, uh, Tiffany Murray, are you in the room? And uh, Fran Hooten, PB. Welcome, ladies. Ms. Kirby, if you'll make them, make them swear. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Ms. Maxwell. Tiffany, Tiffany Michelle Murray is applying for an affiliate broker license. Her principal broker is Francis Fran J. Hooten, uh, license number 230310, and she is the principal broker of Keller Williams Realty Mount Juliet, uh, license number 258732. This firm is located in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. Ms. Hooten was first licensed as an affiliate broker in 1986 and licensed as a broker on 7-1 of 1997. The records indicate that she has been a principal broker off and on since she was licensed as a broker and became the principal broker of Keller Williams Realty Mount Juliet on 6-10 of 2013. This firm was first issued a license on 8-16 of 2005. The track records reflect that the Keller Williams Realty Mount Juliet currently has 98 affiliate brokers, five brokers, and one principal broker. Ms. Hooten has had no disciplinary action taken against her by the commission. The applicant, Tiffany Michelle Murray, submitted an application for licensure. Uh, she has taken and passed the Affiliate Broker National and State Real Estate exams and completed the 90 hours of pre-licensing courses. She revealed the following. On 1-10 of 2004, Ms. Murray was convicted in the Smyrna Municipal Court of Rutherford County, Tennessee, of merchant theft under $500, a misdemeanor. Ms. Murray pled guilty to the misdemeanor and received a sentence of six months supervised probation, community service, and had to make restitution. Ms. Murray states that the misdemeanor conviction was a result of a poor judgment decision she made when she was 18 years old. She says that she chose to take part in the theft of an eyeshadow compact which retailed for $5.99. She has related that she completed all terms of her sentences and, sentence and has moved past this incident. Over the last few years, Ms. Murray has worked in the logistics field, management, and health and safety fields. Currently, she works in the service industry where she is part of a team which trains new hires. She's involved in a number of volunteer activities, often organizing outreach opportunities and overseeing activities. If the commission approves her to move forward in the licensure process, Ms. Murray intends to complete all requirements for her affiliate broker licensure. Thank you, Ms. Maxwell. Ms. Murray, what would you like to say for yourself? I would like to say that that was 12 years ago, and I know I made a stupid mistake. Um, that was something I chose to be a part of with uh, a girlfriend of mine being out. It actually wasn't planned. I don't think when we got there, I don't think that was something I was aware of that was happening. Um, but it was over an eyeshadow that turned around and cost me quite a bit of money in the long run, obviously. Um, I did pay my restitution. Um, I did do, I believe it was 32 hours of community service, which is very humbling in itself to have to pick up trash on the side of a highway in an orange suit or an orange vest. Um, I also uh, did my probation, I never missed a visit. Um, and, and like she said, I have done uh, different community outreach programs uh, where I've helped to organize them, I've held management positions, and I think I've done a, a fairly good job of, of doing a 180 there. 
$5.99 compound. How'd you get caught? Not that I'm just no, thinking that's about fine. that. No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it actually wasn't me that had it on me. Um, it was the girl that I was with that they saw her uh, with something, and they felt that I was her lookout. 18, I did anything I could to keep my parents from being involved in knowing anything, so I just went ahead and did what I was told to do and paid the consequences, to be honest. Just find out. Never. I'm 30 years old, and I've done my best not to even let that come out. This is be being honest. taped. <laughs> <laughs> well, they won't watch Smell it. The world. <laughs> All right, Commissioner's questions for me. Uh, I, I wanted to ask her about um, – uh, she's worked in the logistics field, management, and health and safety. What did you do in those fields? Uh, I originally started out when I was 19. I worked for Osborne Hester Logistics. It is a third-party logistics company. It is uh, worldwide. Um, I worked for them for three and a half years. I started out just verifying the accuracy of orders. Um, after that, I, I progressed because I like to learn new things uh, to where I would fill in for others when they're on vacation or called out sick, and eventually I became the account trainer for that particular medical account. Um, for all new hires and as well as training people. Um, my boss, uh, like anybody who's held a health and safety position, normally they don't relish in it. It is very much all about regulations. It's not all about fun. Um, and, and nobody likes to teach the class on health and safety. It's Nobody seems that interested in listening to it. Uh, so I was delegated with that task along with since I was training for, for job things. Uh, when I left there, I went to work for a company called Horn USA out in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, I worked there for two years, becoming management there. Uh, I ended up taking over their log logistics department. I took care of warehousing. Uh, I took care of accounts payable and production support. I also took on the role there of health and safety manager for uh, their company as well. And they are a worldwide company, but I only dealt with the, uh, with the Americas. What was the name of the company? Horn USA, H-O-R-N. Okay. And so what are you uh, – it says you currently are working in the um, – in the service industry, what are you doing there? I actually work downtown. Uh, I actually bartend. Um, I left Horn USA to uh, pursue a startup company, which did not uh, do so well financially. And I had worked in the service industry prior. Uh, side jobs, I've normally held at least two jobs. Um, and so I just kind of fell back on what I knew and uh, I found myself down here doing this now. How long have you been doing that? Uh, I have worked for Tequila Cowboy downtown for two and a half years. Okay. Other questions? All right, Ms. Hooten, what's your interest in this applicant? Well, I've um, met Ms. Murray when I was doing the interview process, and I think she comes with a lot to bring to our company. And um, I feel that something that happened like happened to her 12 years ago would she's turned her life around and has uh, become a productive member of society and we'd like to have her in our office as an agent. Questions for Ms. Hooten? Well, I have a comment and then I'll make a motion. I wish that our young people today could see what a dumb mistake of $5.99 can do to your life and I hope you share that. I know you don't want your parents to know but it is valuable for kids today to know what those dumb mistakes can do to the rest of their life. Um, and I'd like to make a motion that we approve Ms. Murray. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner DeChar, a second by Commissioner Franks, that um, Ms. Murray be allowed to proceed to get a real estate license. Is there discussion on the motion? Yes, sir. I'm going to need to recuse myself on this one. You're, you're welcome to. Thank you. All right, further discussion? Let's vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Motion passes seven ayes and one abstention. All right, ladies, thanks for coming down. Good luck in the real estate business. Good time. Yeah. All right, we are now to the legal report. Ms. Ms. Kirby will, at this point, begin to amaze people at how fast she can read and how many words she can say. <laughs> and at some point, we might ask her to slow down or re-explain <laughs> or state her position, but she's got the floor. 
can I say one thing before I start legal report? You sure may. Um, oh, you checked on something for us, didn't you? I did. Um, and legal, legal department has doesn't see a problem with distributing Ms. Maxwell's PowerPoint presentation to the entities that would like to have it. Um, I do think that would require a motion from the commission to proceed with that. And I don't know what the logistics will, are going to look like. I don't know if that's something you guys want to decide or um, I don't know if these these boards and associations are going to request it from her or if she has a list that she sends things to. I don't know how that might work. But um, legal department doesn't have a problem distributing it. And um, if you want to vote on that, that would be Mr. fine. Bloom. Yes, I'd like to move that we uh, proceed with that. Now, for the distribution, I'm going to have to rely on Eve for some suggested idea about how to do that. Without putting any more on your shoulder. Oh, are you? I'm, I'm going to second it. Thank you, Ms. Franks. <laughs> I have a motion by Commissioner Bloom, seconded by Commissioner Franks, that uh, the executive director be allowed to proceed with uh, distribution of the appropriate PowerPoint presentation through the appropriate channels. Discussion on the motion. We'll vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. All right, Ms. Kirby. Any consent order authorized by the commission should be signed by respondent and returned within 30 days. If said consent order is not signed and returned with the allotted time, the matter may proceed to a formal hearing. Um, these first three are, are representation. Does, would the commission like me to go ahead and read them again since we have new commissioners or just skip to the representation? Yeah, new commissioners, part? I think it'd be appropriate to read them. Okay. 2015008101, 2015008102, and 2015008103. The following was presented in regard to all three respondents at the August 2015 meeting. Complainant states that complainant submitted an offer on property on property via Respondent 1 affiliate broker on February 3, 2015. Complainant states that immediately after complainant submitted their offer, Respondent 1 told them there were multiple offers on the property. Complainant states that their agent asked Respondent 1 if they needed to submit a best and final offer and were told by Respondent 1 that the bank, the seller, would counter all offers. Complainant states that they tried to stay in touch with Respondent 1 to make sure they were given this opportunity and were told on February 19th that they would have a reply soon. On February 25th, complainant and Respondent went to Respondent's firm to see what was going on because they had not heard anything regarding a counter offer. Complainant states a complainant met with respondent three then unlicensed who told complainant that the offer was never submitted complainant's agent then submitted a new offer to respondent three complainant state that they were told by respondent two principal broker the next day that the bank had countered the offer complainant state that they had immediately accepted the offer and submitted the proper forms complainant state that they were not they were sent to separate disclosure and confidentiality forms from respondent three on february 25th and 27th which they signed and returned respondent three then sent environmental reports to complainants complainants state that on march 2nd their agent contacted respondent three asking for the final contract from the bank respondent three told complainants that another bidder had come up in price and his offer was accepted complainants state that this was nearing the end of the, their inspection period. Complainants state that they had a contract with the bank seller and that the bank had then entered a contract with another buyer. Complainants also state that Respondent 3 negotiated pricing and other aspects of the transaction while unlicensed. Respondent 1 states that Respondent 1 was out of the office dealing with personal issues during the time of this transaction. Respondent 1 states that Respondent 1 recalls passing all correspondence related to this property on to Respondent 2 principal broker. To the best of Respondent 1's recollection, Re Respondent 1 was no longer the listing agent on this property at the time the events took place, never met complainants or their agent, and never showed them the property. Respondent one states that Respondent 1 is no longer affiliated with this firm and therefore has no access to any emails or documents related to this transaction and defers all other responses to Respondent 2 Principal Broker. Respondent 2 Principal Broker states that a potential buyer for an offer on the property in mid-January of 2015 after the price was already reduced significantly from $255,000 to $90,000. The bank seller did not want to ex execute any documents at that point because it did not want to go through all of the corporate approvals in advance only to have the buyer back out during the due diligence period. Instead, the bank supplied the buyer with due diligence information after executing a confidentiality agreement. Respondent 2 states that the complainant came into the firm office with an offer for the same price as the first buyer on February 25th. Respondent state 2 states that Respondent 3 told complainant they had never received a previous offer from the complainant, therefore an offer was never transmitted to the seller. Respondent 2 states that complainant then sent an offer via email to Respondent 3 the same day with, res with the same offer and same dates as the supposed previous offer. The firm never received, but with the wrong seller name. Complainant's agent was copied in the email countering the offer. Respondent 2 stated that Respondent 3 provided complainant with the correct seller information and complainant returned an offer with the correct information. Respondent stated that complainant's agent replied, thanking respondents for their help. Respondent 2 states that Respondent 2 then advised the seller that there were now two legitimate purchasers and the seller asked Respondent 2 to work with both potential buyers to get the best price and move the sale as quickly as possible since they were going to be losing a substantial amount of money on the loan. Respondent 2 states that respondents then sent complainant the confidentiality agreement and due diligence information which complainant signed and returned. Respondent 2 states that the other buyer went in on 
up in his offer, meeting complainant's offer, and the respondent to recommended the seller accept complainant's offer. The seller, however, accepted the buyer's the other buyer's offer. Respondent two states the complainant is upset that he was unable to purchase the property, but the complainant's offer was not any higher than the original offer and was not worthy of any special consideration. Regarding the allegation that respondent two respondent three was conducting unlicensed real estate activity, respondent two states that respondent three did nothing more than assemble and pass along documents pertaining to the transaction, as well as keep the parties appraised of the current status of the transaction. Respondent two states that all of these actions were respondent two's direction by phone, while respondent two was out of town at a conference. Respondent two states that respondent two negotiated the price with the complainant's agent directly over the phone, and respondent three never did any negotiating of price, terms, or conditions, and never showed the property. Respondent two states that respondent three at the time had already submitted her documentation to TREC to receive her affiliate broker's license and had successfully completed the education requirement and was very familiar with the required separation of administrative and licensee duties. Respondent th 3 states that Respondent 3 did nothing but disclose the status of the listed property and deliver documents, which is allowed under TREC laws. Respondent 3 states that a complainant came in on February 25th to discuss a co contract for a listed property with Respondent 2. Respondent 3 states that Respondent 2 was at a conference, but Respondent 3 was aware of the status of the property and informed the complainant. Respondent 3 states that Respondent 2 then spoke with the owners who decided they would put the drafting of the contract with another buyer on hold to consider complainant's offer. Respondent 2 then told Respondent 3 to send the complaint, complainant the confidentiality agreement and due diligence forms in case the bank went with the complainant's offer because the bank did not want to lose any more time. Respondent 3 states that, that on the following workday, Respondent 2 told Respondent 3 that the seller had countered both parties and are waiting until the end of the week for responses. Respondent 3 let complainant's agent know of the delay and gave the, the lockbox code, which he had requested. On Thursday of that week, Respondent 2 notified Respondent 3 that the seller decided to go with the original buyer. Respondent 2 asked Respondent 3 to notify complainant's agent since Respondent 3 was still out of town, to which complainant's agent wanted further explanation. Respondent 3 states that since Respondent 3 had not spoken with the owner's complainant's agent would have to speak with Respondent 2 when he got back to town. They spoke the following week. Respondent 3 states that Respondent 3 had successfully completed the real estate courses and examination was issued a license on March 8th. Complainant provided nothing in indicating any contact with respondent, respondent 1, nor did complainant produce any evidence of an offer submitted before February 25th. Email correspondence between the parties indicate that complainant submitted an offer on February 25th via email to respondent 2 and 3. In a previous email that day, respondent 3 tells complainant's agent that respondent 2 will submit the offer to the owners. On the 27th, Complainant's agent returns the signed confidentiality agreements, which provides that the form does not obligate the buyer or the seller as to the purchase or sale of the property. Respondent 3 immediately replies with the due diligence do documents. An email sent from Respondent 3 to Complainant's agent on March 2nd states that since the bank now has two offers on the table, they're going to give the buyer to the, the other buyer until the end of the week to go up in his offer. Email correspondence also indica indicates that the bank was drafting a contract for the original buyer when Complainant's offer was submitted but put it on hold to consider complainant's offer. Email correspondence also shows Respondent 2 stating that complainant is a legitimate buyer and that Respondent 2 will recommend complainant's deal to the seller up on an upcoming conference call. Email shows that the other buyer increased his offer to the complainant's price and the seller chose the other buyer. There is no documentation or correspondence indicating that a counteroffer was made or accepted. The written offer submitted by complainant on February 25th was unexecuted. There is no correspondence indicating that Respondent 3 negotiated any terms or did anything other than deliver documents and disclose the status of the listed property. The recommendation was to dismiss as to all three respondents, and the commission voted to refer the matter to Commissioner Hills for review as to all three respondents and to report at the next commissioner meeting. Um, I also have some information to add on respondent one, which it's up to the commission whether they would want to hear that first or hear from Commissioner Hills first. Just for this part, because Respondent 1 did not ever answer the questions that you requested or information, so that left me at hold, so I think you need to add Respondent 1's. Okay, okay. sure. Upon further review, legal counsel has found additional pertinent information in regard to Respondent 1. Regard Respondent 1's first license was issued in July of, 20 of 2005 and expired in July of 2009. Respondent 1 reinstated the license in December of 2009 and it again expired in September of 2013. Respondent 1 retested and reapplied and was issued a license in March of 2015. Trek records indicate that Respondent 1 did not have a valid license from September 5, 2013 until March 10, 2015. Respondent 1's current license was issued just after the events of this complaint took place. Legal counsel found several news articles and blog posts on the website for the firm which Respondent 1 supposedly was working during the time Respondent 1 was unlicensed, Respondent 2's firm, 
which detail specific properties where Respondent 1 represented a party in the transaction during the unlicensed period. In addition, there were blog posts and news articles written by or about Respondent 1 during the unlicensed period which identify Respondent 1 as a real estate broker. In Respondent 1's response to the above complaint, Respondent 1 stated that Respondent 1 was no longer the listing agent on the property when the events of the complaint took place. Legal counsel followed up with Respondent 1 and Respondent 2 to find out when Respondent 1 was the listing agent on the property, when Respondent 1 was employed by Respondent 2's firm, and what Respondent 1's role was at the time. Respondent 1 replied in stating that Respondent 1 has no, no further information and has spent too much time on this issue and requested it come to a conclusion. Respondent 2 replies similarly, which legal counsel finds odd considering they no longer work at the same firm, stating Respondent 2 has no further information that Respondent 1 is no longer an employee. Respondent 2 also states that Respondent 2 has spent way too much time on this $75,000 property and requested the matter be brought to a conclusion. Respondent 1 stated that legal counsel has enough information to determine that the potential buyer is just sour grapes because the seller did not choose his offer. Uh, oh, do you want me to give my recommendation or wait until the... My recommend uh, let me do well that this I'm trying to get your she, report as okay. well. I don't want to I'll bias my, anybody's thoughts until Okay. I'll give my report. And, and my recommendation was just pertaining to that particular issue, not the other the first complaint. Okay, so are you, did you look into respondent one at all? Yes, and, and my findings was uh, even though counsel had requested several times it went unanswered. So with unanswered information, I couldn't determine anything. However, I think um, counsel. Okay, so. so but I, I find it odd that someone would write an offer and it never show up. All right, so you don't have anything to add related to respondent one because it wouldn't answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, now counsel has brought us additional, additional information. Would you make a recommendation now on respondent one? My, res my recommendation is to open a complaint against Respondent 1 for unlicensed activity and a complaint against Respondent 2 for a viol violation of Code Section 6213.302, which says it's an unlawful for any licensed broker to employ or compensate any person who is not a licensed broker or affiliate broker for performing any acts regulated by the chapter. And then in regard to the, the previous, the pl complaint on hand is to discuss it upon Commissioner Hill's presentation. All right. So... Let's let's talk about respond respondent one. Council's recommendation is to open up a complaint against respondent one. Now there's already a complaint open against respondent two, right? This is a separate complaint at this point. The initial complaint is open against respondent one, two, and three. My recommendation for the complaint that we're discussing now is still to dismiss all of them based on that complaint. My recommendation is then to open separate complaints against respondent one and two for this other unlicensed activity. But my recommendation for the complaint that was heard last week, which is the underlying complaint, is still to dismiss all three because my opinion is that we don't have evidence for violations there. But I do see potential violations else, elsewhere. Okay, uh, Commission, you've heard counsel's report. Uh, let's, let's, let's go back, I'll, I'll change directions here. Uh, the original complaints filed against one, two, and three, counsel's recommendation is to dismiss. She can't find enough evidence to document the complaint. Ms. Hills, did you find any additional evidence that showed the complaint, complaint was valid? I feel I did. Um, and would you like for me to tell yes, you? Yes, please. You got the floor. Um, respondent one and respondent three were not licensed during the whole chain of events. And even though they had taken classes and, and responded when it had previously been licensed, they were unlicensed. So they knew better. One had been licensed before and, and, and they had completed or were taking their, their um, education to and filing for their uh, license. So, um, Respondent to is the principal broker at the firm where Respondent 1 and Respondent 3 were employed, I assume. Um, the, the information that was sent in by the broker, by the Respondent 1 broker, excuse me, Respondent 2 broker and Respondent 3 
was um, they supported their argument was supported by the Tennessee Real Estate Commission's frequently asked questions about license um, unlicensed assistance and they pointed out everything that the unlicensed assistant could do but they failed to to point out uh, unlicensed employee assistant secretary may not do and and the main one is discuss or explain listings offers contracts or other similar matters with people outside the firm the um, there are emails uh, the principal broker was out of town it appears and there are e many emails uh, well one of which let me go back the signature of the email of respondent three who was unlicensed is the same signature automatic signature on the email before on all the emails before she, the before respondent three got their license as it is as it is now that respondent three has the license so you can't tell whether they're a real a real estate licensee or not from the signature before or after so if you receive an email from respondent three to the agent who had sent an offer in um, talking about it um, which makes it appear respondent three was participating I would think the respondent three if I were on the other end I would have thought respondent three had a license at the time so so let's that's my finding okay <coughs> so so council after further review has decided it might be appropriate to open up a complaint against uh, respondent one and two one for number one for practicing real estate without a license number two for the principal broker having someone who's not licensed working in his firm what do you what do you think about that recommendation opening up to open a complaint on those on those charges or those those possible violations yes well they either were or they weren't mm -hmm. well okay and so you think number three clearly was doing practicing real estate without a license that's I do. okay so we've got we've got a complaint filed against number three right council has found not enough evidence to recommend any kind of citation against one and two for the complaint charges but they found other charges <coughs> legal departments come up with other charges against one and two so I got three complaints here I'm just trying to figure out how we want to handle them if let's let's take yours first you would you like to make a recommendation regarding agent number three respondent number three yes for um, 6213301 which is uh, unlawful for any person directly or indirectly to engage in or conduct or to advertise or claim to be in engaging in or conducting the business or acting in the capacity of a real estate broker affiliate broker timeshare person or adequate agent all right so that that's your motion what what would be the civil penalty that you suggest we offer to that particular agent Really not fair questions I'm asking Miss Hills but 500 $500 civil penalty what about maybe attending this meeting or that was excuse me yes and attending the meeting okay the so next 180 days all right so Miss Hills is making a motion correct that correct. suggests that we offer to this respondent number one no number three I'm sorry yes. number three a civil penalty of five hundred dollars and an obligation to attend one of our meetings in the next six months question let me see if I can get a second first Is I'll there? second the motion okay thank you Mr. McMullen Mr. McMullen you have the floor can Miss Hills make the motion or does she need to recuse herself because she's seen the file thank you sir um, if she wants to withdraw that motion yeah, it's, it'll, it'll be my motion okay uh, the motion is off the floor and it's now 
And it would be my recommendation. Yeah, that's okay. You and I, I move to uh, to accept Ms. Hill's recommendation. Okay. Is there a second to Mr. McMullen's motion? There is a second by Mr. Chara. The motion on the floor is to offer respondent number three an agreed citation, and I'll get to you, Mr. Bloom, uh, pay $500 civil penalty and attend one of our meetings within the next six months. Commissioner Bloom, we're discussing the motion. I think Mallory had a point. Ms. Kirby. I, I just want to say, of course, the commission can, you know, vote on that if that's their decision if that's gonna be what happens we need to pinpoint some specific activity that this person was doing that was broker activity um, because I, I mean I can't write a consent order if I don't know what we're considering the unlicensed activity so I, it may be helpful. I don't know if it, um, what a, um, like an email to someone outside of the firm but what's the content that's unlicensed activity uh, and I read it as long as it gives no information. If there's no names or any okay. firm names or people um, names, that's fine. So respondent three responded to an agent outside the firm. Now that the bank, and, it, and it's just directly to them, not even copied. Now that the bank has two offers on the table, they want to give the other party a chance to come up in his offer. This party has until Friday to do so. In the meantime, you should have the paperwork you need to start some due diligence. Let me know if there's any question you have. Otherwise, we will catch up uh, at the end of the week. Uh, also, um, are you saying though that the two signatures say that she is a, a, a licensed real estate agent? Um, no, they don't say okay. anything. They're the same. My recollection uh, of looking company. at the email, yeah, with the, uh -huh. was her name and the um and the, the firm name, name and then like the phone the number. I think that was all cell phone and okay. things like that. So I think I think what Ms. Hiltz, if I had to interpret what you're saying, is that it's clear to her, or at least her recommendation to us, is that this this unlicensed person was practicing real estate without a license, based on what is and is not allowed by the content of that email. And, and that she willfully did it because, I mean, she had classes about it. My, my concern is that the $500 for unlicensed activity is not what we typically give. We typically give $1,000. Well, this, you know, the floor is wide open for an amendment to the motion. You have the floor at this moment, Ms. Franks. I'd like, like to amend the motion then that the fine be uh, $1,000, not 500 or second? I second. Second by Commissioner DeChart. Mr. McMullen. I support the amendment. Thank you, sir. So what's in front of the commission right now is an offer of a civil penalty of $1,000 in attendance at a full meeting of the Tennessee Real Estate Commission within six months. Is there further discussion? Let's vote. Those in favor of that motion vote aye. Aye. Those opposed no. Aye. That, that motion passes unanimously with one abstention. Oh, let me poke you right in the ear. <laughs> Miss, Miss Hills. <laughs> All right, now we got to get back to respondents one and two. In, in the original, in the original complaint, the law department found no reason to give that complaint any credence, and they recommended that the complaints against one and two be dismissed. Now we have not officially handled that complaint yet, so the chair would entertain a motion to accept council's recommendation. On that particular complaint, we, we've question. got more to go with them, but I got to get a motion first to see if we can do that. Well, don't we need to hear what Ms. Hills has to say about that let's, first? Let's um, know how to structure the motion. Yeah, let's let's do that. Do you have a report on those guys? Respondent two, which is the principal broker, I I would recommend. Um, that 6213, 612, um, I can't read my writing, B, 14 and 15, 312, and then 6213, 401, 1, 431, excuse me. What were the uh, 6213, 312, which ones? Uh -huh. 312. Uh, B 14 and 15 and 62 13 
So can you uh, tell us why you're making that recommendation? Not that not you've given us a, a penalty amount, but what, what, what is it that caused you to think that these guys might be, uh, the complaint might be valid? Because he was the broker and the activity was going on. I, 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 he, he, yes, he was absent, but he was copied or directed, um, which, which you couldn't follow the phone direction. There was no information on phone directions, so everything would come from its phone direction. And, and I think that was the way to do the business. Ms. Kirby, why did you why did you recommend dismissing against the principal broker? Well, I, I, I felt that Respondent 3's actions were explaining this or disclosing the status of a property, which is under the frequently asked questions allowed. Um, so that's why I didn't, since I didn't feel that her, that person's conduct was a violation, that's why I didn't have anything on Respondent 2. Now, with um, the 312B15, that is in the case of a licensee uh, for su supervising another licensee, and Respondent 3 wasn't licensed at that time, so that one At that time, wouldn't you're right. So what does that leave us with from Ms. Hill's perspective? So that's removing well, you, the You could uh, say it was 14. a violation of 302 unlawful for any licensed broker to employ or compensate any person who is not a licensed broker or affiliate broker for performing any acts regulated by this chapter. 62.13.302. If you say that what Respondent 3 did was a violation of 301, then you could say that what Respondent 2 did was a violation of 302. Chairman, can I ask Ms. Hills a question? Hey, Ms. Hills, who was not responding to your inquiries? One, two, or three? Not to my inquiry, to, to counsel's inquiry. Respondent one. Never did. Uh, responded in saying, and I'll quote, um, uh, and this is once um, uh, Ms. Kirby had, had questioned again, uh, it, it said, to the best of my recollection, I was no longer the listing broker on this property, and that was from someone who did not have a license at the time. Okay, but that's not the person we're talking about now. No. Okay. So let, let's stay focused here. Um, Diane, Ms. Hills is s saying there's a valid reason to offer a civil penalty or a agreed citation to the principal broker. And is, is it because he was the principal broker? Okay, now, now let's go back to Ms. Yes. Ms. Kirby's recommendation, which she's just made for the first time today, which is to open a complaint against Respondent 1 for unlicensed activity and a complaint against Respondent 2 for violation um, of employing basically an unlicensed person. Now, what are you suggesting that it's your, your um, analysis of this case says there's no need to open a complaint because you're already satisfied that's what happened you speak please these are these are two separate uh, unlicensed activities and with two different sets of facts so I don't I, I think if if you find that there's that this person the principal failed to supervise or violated by having unlicensed people doing licensee activities, that it would need to be two separate things. Because respondent three is because of the events of this complaint. Respondent one would be the other th things that I found that don't have anything to do with this complaint. The, the only thing, and, and, and that, that I struggled, I'm sorry. Yes, no, speak. I want you to speak. <laughs> that I struggled with for a long time, but, I, I, and I have no facts other than I've never known someone, a licensee, to write an offer, go to the trouble to write an offer on something and not deliver it somewhere. So Respondent 3 appeared to, that was the first they had known about it at, by the end of the month. And since Respondent 1 and Respondent 2 were not responding about anything, uh, and, and that was part of this 
uh, complainant's complaint was that their offer had never been addressed. I don't have proof to know that that's where it went was to respondent one, but I would think it went somewhere. So it would still be the same complainant, and, and I don't know if it needs to be separated like you say. I, I'm not sure. Diane, though, didn't you refer to something um, in what you were reading about uh, respondent one at some point being a listing agent? Yes, that was respondent one's one statement. Um, I quote, uh, and this was when questioned again to try to get more information from Mrs. Kirby. When questioned again, the quote was, to the best of my recollection, I was no longer the listing broker on this property. So, I mean, they, and that was after trying to get more information. I specifically asked that question after the, after that after last meeting, and I mean, I think I read to you how they how this person responded was basically, "I'm not giving you any more information." Well, Chairman, would it bothered. would it make sense? It seems like you've got several violations or potential violations here. You've got what we just voted on as to respondent three being unlicensed. And then it seems like along with that, you would have a uh, issue with respondent two, the principal broker. And so that you'd have that, that's one set. Then the second set would be, it sounds like what respondent one did in this transaction with being unlicensed would be a violation. And then along with that, you would have another claim against respondent to the principal broker for supervising that unlicensed person <coughs> in this transaction. And then the third set would be the things that legal counsel found where respondent one was involved in other unlicensed activities and other transactions. And along with that, a claim against the principal broker respondent to, and that w those would be handled in the new complaint. But on this one, it seems like you got unlicensed by three, unlicensed by one, and two instances of supervision of unlicensed people by respondent two. Can I just add one more thing? Um, I did get the listing agreement on this property, and it was respondent two was listed as the listing agent. The principal broker was listed as listing agent, and the date on it went way before this complaint. And so it would appear that that respondent two was the listing agent on this complaint, which is why it was confusing when respondent one was saying I was no longer the listing agent. So I don't know if respondent one was ever the listing agent on it. According to the listing agreement they showed me, it looks like respondent two was the only listing agent there was, unless it went, unless it was listed for a really long time, there was one before that. But I specifically asked, was this the first listing agreement for this property? And respondent two said yes. Um, so that's why I'm not sure if respondent one was ever the listing agent on this property. But, but he couldn't, the, the respondent one wouldn't have had a license during that time where there's not an, there's not enough paperwork. And I think deliberately so probably from respondent one and respondent two, it's like, I don't know, or I, or, or the emails and all my files were left there and nothing about any of that, that the complainant co said and, and had uh, nothing, there's nothing to say that there is, which makes me think that they were, uh, that that was just a process that they um, work the file, whether you're the one on the name or not, they're working the file. So do you have the listing agreement or do you have the MLS printout? The listing, listing agreement. agreement. Okay, so we don't actually know what the MLS said or have the, history from the MLS that would show the listing agents on that property? No. no. Okay. In the very beginning of the, of the summary, it says that immediately after complainants submitted their offer, respondent one told them there were multiple offers on the property. Complainants state that their agent asked respondent one if they needed to submit a best and final offer and were told by respondent one that the bank seller would counter all offers. Complainants state that they tried to stay in touch with Respondent 1 to make sure they were given this opportunity and were told on February 19th that they would have a reply soon. So does that constitute discussing or explaining yes. listings, offers, contracts, or other similar matters mm -hmm. with persons outside the yes. firm? Yes, and that, and 
but we only have the complainant's story of that. That the respondent one and respondent two never addressed it. So well, there's not. But, but they don't. And that's I mean, a fourth offense that they didn't respond back to the uh, to uh, track. Mm -hmm. yeah. They did respond. I mean, he did respond. He said he doesn't have any recollection of ever meeting them. And, and I left all my information at my previous employer. Yeah. He says, to his knowledge, he never met them, never talked well, and, about And this property. person was licensed in 2005. It expired in 2009. They relicensed in 2009. It expired in 2013. They relicensed in March 2015. Uh, so this is total sloppy, total sloppy here. We don't have to have an admission by respondent one that he did violate the law in order to right. find probable cause and to make an offer of a civil penalty. We've got the allegation that's there, and then we don't really have a, a response um, that I can see that really addresses it one way or the other. As parallel, I mean, you would think that was what happened. All right, Ms. Kirby, you just rein us in if we get out of line here, okay, for a second. First of all, do you believe there's a motion on the floor? I don't believe I've heard one. <laughs> I don't think there is. Right? I made a motion that it be raised a thousand dollars. Well, I, we already we took that, care of we that. vote on that one. Okay. All right, I'm going to go to Commissioner McMullen. Let's go back to uh, respondent number three. So we've offered an agreed citation. Would you like to make a motion related to the principal broker as it relates to number three? I would move that we offer a civil penalty of one thousand dollars to respondent number two. For violation of section 16 dash excuse me 62 dash 13 dash 302 for um, supervising the unlicensed activity of respondent number three with respect to this complaint second a second by commissioner franks you all have heard the motion it's related to the principal broker and his lack of supervision of respondent number three it's just technically we probably should add uh b14 because there's no specific civil penalty range for um, 302, so uh, you know, I'd be 14 to that yes, please. as well. That's perfect. All right, let's vote. On, let's vote on that motion. If you're in favor of that motion, vote aye. 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 If, you vote, if you yes, and throughout the vote, Miss Hills will be shown as an abstention. The motion passes on a seven aye and one abstention vote. Now, Mr. McMullen, would you like to speak to respondent number one? But I move that we. Um, offer a civil penalty of one thousand uh, dollars, along with the other typical meeting attendance, etc., to respondent number one for violation of 62-13-301 and 62-13-312B14 um, for unlicensed activity with respect to this transaction. For a second to that motion. Second. Second by Commissioner Dechara. <clears throat> discussion on the motion. Let's vote. Those in favor of that motion, vote aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The motion passes seven. Aye. And one abstention, Ms. Hills abstains. Mr. McMullen, now back to the principal broker, respondent number two, as it relates to number respondent number one. Mr. Chairman, I move that we offer a civil penalty of $1,000, attendance at the meeting, <laughs> et cetera, uh, to respondent number two for violation of 62-13-302 and 62 dash. 13-312B14 for supervising the unlicensed activities of respondent one with respect to this transaction. For a second. Second. Second by Commissioner Franks. Discussion on that particular motion. Let's a, vote then. Those in favor of the motion. Uh, Ms. Kirby. I just have a question. Yes. Um, was there, was, as I correct in hearing, there was no meeting requirement for the respondent two for the first one? It was for meeting requirements to be with all of these. Okay, so since we have two for respondent two, is there one one meeting requirement for each consent order? Yes. Bill Stewart so would two. Say yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bill Stewart will say yes. So let's vote on the motion. Well, I'm sorry, I'm being confusing. This is all going to go in one consent order because it's so. We have multiple violations. So we have two violate each two violations each of sixty two thirteen three oh two for respondent two. So my understanding is we have a thousand dollars for each violation, and then w is it one meeting requirement total or two? Meeting it sounded to me like it was consensus that 
Two violations, two meeting attendances. Okay. Jenica has something. I don't know if we have we have we done that in the past though. Um, yes. Okay. This guy out of Memphis. I did one complaint. Jenica. I'm just I trying to mind. think logistically with when we're writing this. There's one complaint number um, for respondent to, so that would be rather confusing to give him two separate consent orders under one complaint if we can consolidate that consent order i'm i'm sure you can require two meetings within six months but if we can consolidate and we can make it clear within that consent order it's for failure um or for employing an unlicensed broker respondent one unlicensed broker respondent three but it would probably just have to be one consent order since there's only one complaint number. I think that's right. I think in the past, for, even when we've had multiple violations by one person, we may have hit them for multiple civil penalties, but only one meeting attendance. Okay, so you're, so I, will that take care of it? I'll make sure. So you want respondent two to get two thousand dollars for. Separate. For two separate each. violations for employing two unlicensed brokers and one meeting attendance. I think one is probably right. But right, it's up to the it's up to the will of the commission. I know I'm I'm looking around for the will and I see all ends of the will up here. <laughs> <laughs> well what have we what have we are what have we already what have we already approved? We approved one thousand dollars by number two and one meeting? Oh. We only approved one thousand dollars. Well, what, what Jenica is trying to get us to say is that oh, we're going to find, not find, offer civil penalty for two different violations and two different motions, and that one should be one motion with with two. Well, I'm trying. To, we've already had one motion that we've approved for number two. And I don't think that motion included the meeting because I didn't hear it. Okay. it Maybe it intended so to, but I don't think it did. Okay. So the motion that we've already done was just a thousand dollars without a meeting. And the motion that's on the table right now is another thousand dollars and a meeting. So if we approve this emotion, if we approve this motion commotion as on the table, it would be a net of two thousand dollars and one meeting. Right. I thought the first motion when you made it though, you said the thousand dollars and et cetera. Which you which did to me took the to be I can't remember if it was that, that one or was not. The, yeah, that was the I think that was for respondent one. Going well. Or Maybe. in any respect, the intent of the commission at this point that is respondent three's got a thousand dollars of meeting requirement, respondent one's got a thousand bucks of meeting requirement, respondent two's got two thousand bucks and a meeting requirement. I yes. think we should review the and tape. It, no, okay. and, if, <laughs> and so if somebody wants to do something different, they could just because we haven't voted on this last motion yet, somebody could make a motion to amend that motion to up it to two meetings. Floor is open. Which would, be unusual, like to... which would be unusual too. <coughs> Two meeting requirements would be unusual. If, you, if, you, if Fontaine, for instance, if you want to say not one meeting but two meetings, now's the right time to say it. I understand that, but be, me being the new member, I don't know what our precedent is here. Don't worry about precedent. Every every situation is, stands on mm -hmm. its own. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that he should go to two meetings because it's two different people. Maybe he'll learn something this time. All right, the, the, uh, the motion, which we'll need a second. I have to amend the motion. I vote to amend the motion Thank to you. be $2,000 and two meetings. All right, re regarding respondent number two. Is that motion for both of those to be completed within the six-month period, or would that be an extended period of time? Six-month period. Are you seconding her motion? Um, he's yeah. he's giving me input. Well, he's also <laughs> seconding the motion. <laughs> Collaboration here. All right. In so, six month in the six month period. Regarding respondent number two, only at this point, what is on the floor is a motion for a two thousand dollar civil penalty, and it and attendance at one meeting within the next six months. An amendment has been offered to strike strike the one meeting in the next six months and replace it with two meetings in the next six months. We need to vote on that amendment. So is there discussion on the amendment? I'd, I'd like to just say this one thing. Please. It's if you'll look at that principal broker and when they were licensed in 88, 
this probably is someone who is grandfathered and probably has maybe not had the education they needed or maybe this would not have happened. So I think it's good that we give them a double dose of getting to come and learn some of the new stuff that the law has provided since 1988. So if it's not grandfathered, what would you say then? Come on in here. Okay, just checking to make sure we're <laughs> well, right. He got his license in 88. I'm thinking he's, he's grandfathered grandfather. or she. All right, so we got to vote on, we have to vote on this amendment. Everybody understand the intent? I hope so. <laughs> if you're in favor of the motion offered by Ms. Taylor and seconded by Mr. Bloom, please say aye. Aye. If you're opposed, say no. No. All right. Uh, let's, um, the chair is going to rule that there were five ayes, two noes, and one abstention. So, question on the motion. So the, the, the amendment passes. Now the motion is on the, on the floor regarding complaint and uh, respondent number two only. You've heard, the, you've heard the discussion. You know the motion. Let's vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. Now we have one more piece of business to handle, Mr. McMullen. Move to uh, open a complaint against respondent number one for unlicensed activity and a complaint against respondent number two for violation of 6213-302. Second. Can we not we do the unlicensed activity from this complaint? Do we have to open another one? Because in this complaint, they're talking about being a listing agent. Mm -hmm. We do because- he found other, other transactions that he had been- uh, but what about in this transaction and what they admitted to? We already did that for this transaction. Okay. That was the thousand against one and the second thousand against two. All right, so oh, we left one in the meeting. That one. I, I apologize. Was there a motion? Mr. McMullen, did you make a motion? I, did. I seconded it. And Ms. Frank seconded it. Thank you. And this motion is only to open a complaint by Trek staff against uh, respondent one and two regarding unlicensed activity or supervision of people who are performing unlicensed activities. Let's vote to see if you guys want to open these complaints. If you're in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 If you oppose, vote no. All right, we've got six, uh, seven ayes and one abstention. Ms. Hill abstains. Now, to, to, to the audience, we don't normally take this long, and guess what? We handled this last month, too. This has been a complicated issue for us. Hopefully, what follows will be somewhat easier, but before we get to those, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Oh. Is that the All right, we're on to complaint number four. Ms. Kirby. Two zero one five zero zero eight zero three one. Respondent listed complainant's home for sale in November of 2013. Complainant states that complainant did not receive a copy of the contract until January of 2015. Complainant states that an offer was made in August of 2014 and that the closing was canceled because buyers had to admit parents to assisted living. The buyers needed cash so they were, that they were going to use towards purchasing the house to pay for the parents' assisted living deposit but would be able to get the, the money out of a retirement account in a couple of weeks. A new closing date was set. Complainant states respondent claims res Respondent had complainant sign, sign an extension, but complainant does not have a copy. The second closing was canceled because of because the IRS had seized the buyer's funds. Buyer then arranged, arranged for an investor to purchase the property from whom the buyer would repay later on. Complainant states that respondent told complainant that buyers would be bringing respondent earnest money, but when complainant asked about the funds again later, respondent said the IRS had frozen the escrow account and the respondent could not access the money at the time. Complainant states that there were many excuses for months regarding the reasons the buyers could not close. Complainant states that complainant asked respondent about the earnest money again in January of 2015, and respondent said respondent should be receiving the funds the following Friday. After 15 months, complainant switched realtors. Complainant asked again, respondent again about the funds and was told that the buyer was not going to pay the funds. Complainant states that respondent also represented the buyer. Respondent states that respondent left a copy of the listing agreement and all the other listing documents with the complainant when the complainant signed the documents, that the complainant put the documents in the basket under the side table next to the recliner she was sitting in after signing. Respondent states that in January of 2015, complainant called respondent stating that the complainant could not find her copy of the paperwork, so respondent dropped off another copy at the complainant's house the next day. Respondent states the complainant is mistaken in stating the complainant never received a copy of the extension. Respondent states that complainant signed it when complainants and respondents' families were all at a high school football game. 
Respondent states that she remembers this because complainant was sharing candy with respondent's daughter and respondent had to hold the candy while the complainant put the copy in her purse. Respondent states the buyer provided a $1,400 check, which respondent deposited in the escrow account. Respondent received notice a few days later of insufficient funds, which buyer advised was due to the account being hacked. Respondent states that the bank verified this information. Respondent states that complainant was willing to give the buyers another chance. Buyers provided another check, which did not clear because the IRS had frozen the account. Respondent states that there were many additional excuses for delay in closing given by the buyer, including the buyer having the flu, the investor being out of town, the investor having the flu, etc. Respondent states that every time there was a delay, respondent called or went to the complainant's home, and each time the respondent did not want to give up on the buyer because there were no other offers to come in on the home. Respondent states that respondent was only a facilitator in the transaction. Respondent states that respondent was shocked when complainant wanted to hire another realtor as respondent loved working for complainant and respondent had tried everything in respondent's power to sell the home. Respondent provided transaction documents which include a purchase and sale agreement dated August 8, 2014, with a closing date of September 18, 2014, and an earnest money requirement of $1,400. There's no indication that the buyer terminated the agreement by written notice after failing to receive the earnest money within one day after the check bounced, as stated in the agreement. There is a partially executed extension that is unsigned by complainant. Respondent provided documentation from the IRS and text messages with the buyers indicating the buyers presented respondent with all the various excuses mentioned by both complainant and respondent for not providing the earnest money or closing. There's nothing indicating that respondent ever received any earnest money from the buyers. As of the time of this report, the ho house appears to still be on the market. From reviewing the documents provided, it appears that respondent and complainant were patient with the buyers because there was no other offers on the house, and unfortunately the sale did not go through because the earnest money was never provided, so no closing took place. The confirmation of agency form indicates respondent was acting as a facilitator. It is legal as a counsel's opinion that none of respondent's actions constitute a violation of Trek statutes and rules. Recommendation is to dismiss. Move to dismiss. Second. Have a motion by Commissioner Franks, second by Commissioner Dechara, that commission accept counsel's recommendation and dismiss this complaint. Ms. Hills. I just have a question. So on the purchase and sale, mm -hmm. and they said it was to be $1,400, did it say within it was to be deposited within so many days? I believe it was, this, it's a standard tar form i believe so yeah and but the provision I, I believe that the the provision indicates that it has to be within a, a certain number of days but then in order to terminate the agreement the seller has to then indicate in writing that the seller wishes to then terminate the agreement i don't think it just automatically terminates the agreement when the earnest money is not deposited in that time period if i'm understanding but it correctly i would think it would be it's the broker's responsibility to tell the involved parties to the money if it's not deposited just um on that form just wondering it seemed to me that the respondent was in constant communication with the complainant now she didn't specifically say whether she told the buyers that they needed to turn in that money or else you know the the seller could terminate the agreement she was also just a facilitator in the transaction and not the the seller's actual agent so uh, oh, i'm all right okay further discussion we've heard the motion is to accept counsel's recommendation and dismiss let's vote those in favor of the motion vote aye aye those opposed no motion passes unanimously five six seven and eight 2015013431, and 2015013433. Complainant was the buyer in the transaction with respondent one, principal broker, and, and three, affiliate broker, acting as facilitators for both buyer and seller. Complainant states that respondent one and three claim they never received the complainant's earnest money, which complainant alleges had been cashed and cleared by the bank. Complainant states that closing was extended from March 31st, 2015 to April 2nd against complainant's wishes, and complainant did not feel comfortable closing because the contract had expired. Complainant alleges that respondent one and three were unethical and states that several transaction documents were not signed and disappeared. Complainant alleges that Respondent 1 had complainant send checks to Respondent 1's home address and alleges that one check disappeared but was cashed. Complainant states that the attorney at closing refused to speak with complainant about the expired contract and complainant did not know what to do because Respondent's had complainant's earnest money. Complainant alleges that respondent one, Respondent's 1 and 3 are not trustworthy. Complainant further states 
The complainant contacted Respondent 4, Principal Broker, about the seller not being out of the house and finally received a call back from Respondent 1. Complainant alleges that Respondent 1 would not help and told complainant to contact the seller directly. Complainant states that none of the agents made an effort to assist the complainant. Respondents 1 and 3 submitted a joint response stating they went above and beyond their duties while working with complainant. Respondents deny lying or being unethical during the transaction. Respondents further state that complainant has attempted to hire three attorneys to file a civil suit against them, but the attorneys did not feel the complainant had a case. Respondents state that the earnest money was placed in their firm's escrow account and returned to the complainant's attorney at closing. Respondents state that the closing date on the contract was for March 31, 2015, and complainant's attorney asked to extend the closing, so respondents notified complainant. Respondents state that complainant advised that complainant was too busy to sign an extension but would sign it at closing. Respondents state that nobody forced complainant to close. Respondents state that after closing, complainant notified respondents that the seller had not moved out, so respondents contacted the seller on complainant's behalf. Respondents state that complainant, on complainant's own accord, went over to the home to visit the seller several times during the transaction and respondents are not sure what transpired during these visit visits. Respondents state that they have been realtors for a long time and have never been accused of lying or being unethical. Respondents feel like they are being slandered by complainants' false accusations. Respondent 2 is a duplicate case opened against Respondent 4, Principal Broker. Trek opened a complaint against Respondent 4, Principal Broker, for failing to supervise Respondents 1 and 3. Respondent 4 submitted a response stating that neither the firm nor the agents involved have ever filed a complaint against them and that Respondents take pride in fair, honest, and ethical dealings. Respondent 4 explained that the complainant entered into a contract to purchase a home on March 11th with an original closing date of March 31st. Due to survey work performed on the complainant's behalf, it was necessary to move the closing date to April 3rd, 2015. Respondent 4 states that complainant told Respondents the complainant was too busy to have the agents come and get her signature and would instead sign the extension at closing. Respondent 4 states that the closing attorney agreed to proceed with the preparing the closing documents because she knew the complainant personally. Respondent 4 states the complainant was very aware of the new closing date because complainant came to closing at the newly scheduled day and time. Respondent 4 states that it was complainant's attorney who told complainant to stop talking about the contract being expired due to the extended closing and that complainant was in no way forced to close. Respondent 4 states that complainant came by the office requesting copies of the transaction documents the following week. These documents were provided to complainant and complainant did not mention being dissatisfied. Respondent 4 next heard from complainant on April 15th and the seller did not get possession, so the agents contacted the seller who had movers, who had movers coming on April 16th. Respondent 4 states that complainant hung up, the, hung up on the agent when this information was relayed. Respondent 4 states that complainant contacted Respondent 4 again on April 22, 2015, expressing unhappiness with the firm and asked the firm to buy back the home for the full purchase price and all closing costs. Respondent 4 further states that in May, after closing, the firm coordinated the installation of countertops between the seller and complainant pursuant to the contract. Respondent 4 further states that the $500 earnest money was provided by the complainant in two separate checks and states that they were promptly deposited in the firm's escrow account upon receipt. Respondent 4 further states that a check in the amount of $500 was written to the closing attorney the day of closing, and complainant was given a $500 credit on the settlement statement. Respondent 4 further states that the firm recently underwent a check audit and no concerns were found. Respondent 4 states that complainant filed a Better Business Bureau complaint, which was closed. Respondent 4 has tried diligently to be reasonable and sympathetic with complainant, but but states that complainant has not been appeased. Respondent 4 feels that this is a case of buyer's remorse, and Respondent 4 sympathizes with the complainant but cannot remedy it. Respondent 4 further states that complainant listed the property for sale with the firm at a different location and agent on April 22, 2015. Respondent 4 provided bank statements showing two checks in the amount of $250 each, which were deposited on March 18th and March 27th into the firm's escrow account. Documentation shows that the firm wrote two checks for $250 each to the law firm that facilitated the closing, which came out of the escrow account on April 1st. The settlement statement shows that $500 was credited to complainant at closing and was signed by the seller. Complainant and attorney settlement by the seller, the complainant, and an attorney settlement agent on April 2nd, 2015. Respondent 3 was listed as the transaction broker or facilitator for both seller and complainant in the confirmation of agency status. The purchase agreement was executed by the complainant on March 11th, 2015 with the original closing date set for March 31st and possession of the property on April 15th. There is nothing to indicate that the complainant was forced to close or that the complainant was unhappy with the transaction until the complainant could not take possession when, they agreed con when agreed in the contract. This, of course, was no fault of the respondents. The recommendation is to dismiss to all as to all respondents. Motion to dismiss. Second. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner to charge, second by Commissioner McMullen. McWood. How about McWood? McWood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that council's recommendation be adopted and all complaints be dismissed. Is there a discussion? Uh, Mr. Bloom. Yes. One and three, is that one real estate company and two and four another real estate company? No, two and four. Two um, and four are the principal broker. There was a administratively an error there and two were opened. It's the same 
it's the principal broker. Um, and one in three, one is a broker and one is an affiliate broker. They both are at the principal broker's firm. They're all at the same firm. But there's four players. Right. W one and three, two and four. Right, two and four are the same person. We, oh. It was just administratively opened duplicatively, so I, I'm required to present it that way. But it, there's only three people. There just happens to be four complaints opened, one in error. And is it possible for us to know what's under legal review with these two people in six and eight? The same person. Yeah, it's the same. It's referring to the duplicative complaint. This complaint? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, any other comments, questions, motions on the floor is to accept counsel's recommendation and dismiss. Let's vote. Those in favor of the motion vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. Number nine. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two zero one five zero one two seven six one. Complainant alleges that respondent is withholding funds from rental agreements in the amount of nine thousand one hundred forty-five dollars and sixty cents. Complainant hired respondent to manage six properties, and respondent terminated the contract on on August thirty-first, twenty fourteen. Complainant's owner statements from August thirty-first, twenty fourteen, reflect ending balances of. $3,527.84, negative $141.58, $6,638.10, $350.87, $238.63, and $3,530.74 for the six properties for a total outstanding balance of $14,145.60. Complainant submitted a series of emails to respondent requesting the outstanding balance beginning in February of 2015 and received a final payment in the amount of $5,000 on April 15th from the respondent, leaving a total balance owed of $9,145.60. Complainant has yet to receive the remaining balance. The respondent did not submit a response. Recommendation is a consent order in the amount of $1,500 for violations of TCA section 6213.312b5 for failing to account for, for or remit monies that belong to others, uh, 14, and TCA section 6213.312a2 for failing to respond, and rule 1260-02-0097 for failure to disperse money held in escrow within 21 days of written request. So, um, Ms. Kirby, is this $500? For each of three violations, is that your recommendation? That's when I. That's how I came to that number. Yes. I can imagine what's there a, might be some discussion, Mr. Bloom. What's the most we could uh, uh, find here? What's the most? It would be th uh, th three thousand dollars. There's. For, uh, could it be for each transaction? Um, it could. It could be per property. So there's six properties. That's my recommendation. Second. 18,000. Although, well, the second property looks like it had a negative uh, amount owed, so technically probably five would be in violation. Is the fact that it has a negative balance a concern? I mean, well, it, it means it. that the, they don't actually owe any money back to the complainant on that one. It's like a credit they overpaid. But you still got the other two violations there. Failing to respond, or I guess you just got the one. The other one's escrow money. We don't know. Yeah, failing it. to respond was just for the one complaint, so that would just be one violation. Um, so you could do the other two violations. So there's three violations total. One of them's failing to respond, so that's just a one-time thing. That could be a thousand at maximum for that one, and then for the other two violations, it could be for the five properties and then a thousand dollars each violation that would be the maximum so that adds up to 12 000? 11 11 000. that's my recommendation second okay so we have a motion on the floor the motion is to offer the respondent a consent agreement that consists of eleven thousand dollars in civil penalty and i assume mr bloom you'd like for them to be at this meeting as well oh, yeah. in the next six yeah. months and attendance at a full meeting of the Tennessee Real Estate Commission within the next six months. That motion was made by Commissioner Bloom, seconded by Commissioner Hills. Discussion on the motion. 
All right, then let's vote on it. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The motion passes unanimously. And to the audience, remember, we'll take this to that licensee, whoever it is, and see if he or she wants to agree to that. And if she doesn't or he doesn't, they can come back here and have a formal hearing with us and explain exactly what happened. Number 10. 2015012801. Track opened a complaint against respondent principal broker on potential failure to supervise regarding the previous respondent affiliate broker in the above complaint 2015012761. Respondent did not submit a response. And a, consent, a recommendation was consent order in the amount of $1,000 for violation of TCA section 6213312B15 for failure to supervise section 14 and also TCA section 6213313A2 for failing to respond. That, that's in your, your recommendation, 500 bucks for each violation. Yes. Okay. Mr. Bloom. Well, it needs to be more, but I, I would uh, defer to the other commissioners how much that should be. Looks like 2000 to me. Second. Okay, so now the motion on our floor is to accept council's recommendation, but amend it, amend it so that the consent order includes a $2,000 civil penalty as opposed to the recommended $1,000 civil penalty. Motion made by Commissioner Char, seconded by Commissioner Hills. <laughs> And coming to um, one of our well, meetings. Well, that's in here. Thank you. And attendance at a full meeting of the Tennessee Real Estate Commission Always. within the next six months. Is there a discussion on the motion? Let's vote. Those in favor of that motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. Just no. want to point out that one also was grandfathered. You only know. You don't know that. <laughs> I do know uh -huh. that. The they were licensed in 72. I don't mean it. <laughs> that mean, they can be taking education every year. That doesn't mean they're not grandfathered. They are grandfathered. If they want to be. Number 11. You <laughs> <laughs> Complainant states a complainant rented a home from respondent and has new, had numerous problems with the house, including issues with the stove, the dishwasher, and the garage door. Complainant states that repairs took way too long to complete because the property management company had to get permission from respondent who then arranged the repair. Complainant alleges that respondent paid for repairs with a personal credit card and accepted rent payments on behalf of a property management company despite respondent being a broker for another real estate firm. Complainant states that respondent collected the deposit and first and second month's rent even though the rent checks were made out to the property management company. Complainant states that complainant dropped off the next six or seven rent checks at respondent's real estate firm office which was at least five miles from the property management company office. Complainant further states that respondent's attorney stated that respondent had nothing to do with the property and had only referred complainant to the property management company. Complainant states that respondent showed complainant the property, filled out the lease and signed it. Complainant denies allegations from the respondent's attorney that complainant harassed respondent when complainant dropped off a rent check at respondent's real estate firm office. Complainant sent a demand letter to respondent requesting respondent to answer several questions but respondent did not respond. Respondent submitted a response denying the allegations and states this has been ongoing dispute with the complainant over the last few years. Respondent states that respondent had, had the house listed for sale but since they had not found a buyer the homeowner asked respondent to put the house up for rent. Complainant knew respondent through a family member and noticed complainant that the house notified complainant that the house is available. Respondent states that the property management firm prepared a lease which was signed by the complainant on June 1, 2012. Respondent states that the homeowner is respondent's client, so when home, the homeowner asked if respondent could take care of the maintenance for the property, respondent agreed. Respondent alleges respondent made complainant aware that complainant was running from the property management company and not respondent's real estate firm or respondent. Respondent alleges that whenever complainant complained to the property management firm of any problems, the property management firm called respondent, who called the homeowner to get permission to fix the problems. Respondent stated that the homeowner made sure all repairs were kept up, and after completing the repairs, Respondent received reimbursement from the homeowner. Respondent states that respondent is allowed to pay for repairs since respondent received approval from the homeowner. Respondent admits that complainant paid rent at respondent's real estate office firm, but states that the receptionist always, del always delivered the check to the property management company, which rented an office in the same building. Respondent alleges that complainant came to respondent's real estate firm and became angry and threatening, requiring respondent and other agents to escort complainant out of the building. After the property management moved firm offices, Respondent alleges that respondent informed complainant to deliver the rent to the new location and not respondent's real estate firm office. Respondent alleges that complainant harassed respondent, resulting in respondent ceasing involvement with the property. 
The Office of Legal Counsel followed up with the respondent requesting any written agreements between any of the parties involved. Respondent submitted an additional response by and through an attorney stating that there are no written agreements between the respondent, respondent's firm, the owner of the property, or the property management company. Respondent states that respondent receives a small upcharges on the repairs and maintenance of the property and does not possess any documentation of payment or reimbursement from the owner. Respondent states that respa- respondent is not the landlord and does not have a copy of the lease. Complainant submitted a copy of the lease which was, which was on the property management company's letterhead and had respondent signature on the landlord line with the property management company's name printed underneath. Respondent says that the respondent's firm accepted the rent checks and delivered them to the property management company because they were located in the same building. Respondent states that when the property management firm moved to their new location, respondent told complainant he must take the rent payments directly to the property management company. The address for the property management company listed on the lease is the company's current address, which would seem to indicate that respondent's firm and the property management company were never located in the same building during the lease term. According to Trek filing records, the property management company moved to the address listed on the lease in April of 2011. The recommendation is to discuss possible violations, which could potentially be TC CA section 6213312B1, which is making any substantial and willful representation. Three, which is pursuing a continued and flagrant course of misrepresentation. Eleven, which is accepting a commission or any valuable consideration by an affiliate broker from any person except the licensed real estate broker with whom the license is affiliated, or any others the commission deems applicable. So you're you're not making a recommendation. I'm letting you all decide. Uh, commissioners. Well, it would seem to me if there's a lease signed, that I mean, if there's a lease signed and he and the person signed it as the property manager and then said he wasn't. That in itself is a violation. But we, we've got a lot of places we can go with this. Right, one. I, I think so too. So, and we can we can do them one at a time. So, Commissioner, if you'd like to suggest that that particular item you just mentioned violates some portion of TCA, and we'll let Council tell us exactly which one that is. Is that the willful and substantial misrepresentation issue? It could be. These. I saw clearly there's potential problematic things happening here. It wasn't really clear exactly which statutes it would be violating, although it could potentially be any of the ones that I listed and possibly others if you determine that there is. That's why I listed the the ones that I saw were potential problems there. Um, But yes, that would be potentially be a misrepresentation. Ms. Uh, Taylor, would you like to offer a motion that suggests a, uh, a dollar amount and an agreed well, order uh, for that? You know, I don't know what takes further review because in this case, Diane did further review on something before it came up. I don't know whether this is one of them or not, but it seems to me there are quite a few things here, uh, and I'm being first time out. I, I would rather somebody else. Uh, do that than me because I'm uh, but I certainly think something needs to be done here I think we're looking at about three thousand dollars here at least with those three violations because those are each thousand dollar violation correct and what are the three violations the um, failure to supervise 62 13 312 B Misrepresentation. misrepresentation B1 is misrepresentation three pursuing a continued and flagrant course of misrepresentation and 11 accepting a commission or any valuable consideration by an affiliate broker from any person except the licensed real estate broker and the reason I think sug- that I have that last one on there is because it kind of appeared that while this person is a broker, not an affiliate broker. It appeared that this person was acting as an affiliate broker would for the other firm this person's not licensed with. Even though at their firm that they're licensed with, they're an actual broker. Um, But it seemed to be that it looked like he was acting, it looked like he was acting as a 
a, an affiliate broker with the other property management firm, even though he's a, a broker at his actual firm. Is there verbiage on the those um, uh, requests uh, for a respondent not to submit a response? Is there verbiage on a letter sent to them that tells them what happens if they don't respond? Or uh, I mean, he re they res he responded. Oh, okay. One before. Uh, Ms. Kirby, yes. has he paid the $1,500 consent order from uh, previous? Oh, um, yes. Thank you. Didn't learn much. That was unlicensed property management. He was <laughs> licensed. Um. In that one, he it was a separate I checked the property management company on this previous consent order just to see it's it's a he had his own unlicensed company in his brokerage um, I'm not even sure he was principal broker at the time so it's a different kind of different company. circumstances it's definitely a different property management company the one that we're talking about here is fully licensed and has a principal broker in. Okay, I'm gonna make a motion um, for a $3,000 civil penalty and attendance at a commission meeting. Second. As Commissioner Wood, correct? A second of that? All right, I have a motion by Commissioner Chara, seconded by Commissioner McMullen, <laughs> that we offer this uh, licensee a $3,000 civil penalty and an opportunity to appear at one of our commi uh, full commission meetings within the next six months. Just to get it on the on the record, is that for the three violations that I, that yeah. I listed there? Okay. So before we vote, let me just, this one thing that troubles me about this guy. Well, just one in particular. I can only focus on one thing at a time. But this notion that he was receiving the check at his office and then would take it upstairs, if, it, if they're in the same office, why doesn't he just say, go upstairs and pay it? It does not appear they were in the same office. Thank you. Yeah. That, that's where. I mean, he, sa he said they were, but according to the addresses we have on file and the lease, the address on the lease, that's not true. That's all I needed myself. All right, any other discussion? Let's vote on the motion. You've heard it, 3,000 bucks. Come to one of our meetings. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. Number 12. Two zero one five zero one four five six one. Complainant states that complainant sublet a room in, a, in the house respondent was renting, and respondent was responsible for paying the utilities. Complainant states that several times utilities were shut off to t due to tardy payments, and that the house had other issues, including faulty wiring, no smoke detectors, and leaking appliances. Complainant states that complainant gave respondent plenty of notice to find a new tenant before complainant moved out. Complainant states that after moving out, respondent gave complainant a check for the $575 security deposit and $225 for the washer and dryer fee. Complainant states that both checks bounced right away, and respondent rarely responds to complainant's calls requesting to meet with the money. Respondent states that respondent rented the subject property in April of 2014 in order to have a place to stay upon selling respondent's home. The closing on respondent's home was date was delayed until late June, so respondent subleased the rooms in the subject property. Respondent had all sub lessees pay a security deposit and sign a lease, stating that the deposit was only refundable if respondent was given 30 days' notice to secure a new subtenant. Respondent states the complainant gave only 10 days' notice right around the Christmas holiday and demanded a refund of the deposit. Respondent states that although respondent does not believe respondent was under any obligation to return the security deposit, respondent wrote refund checks as a courtesy. Respondent states that respondent bought a home and moved out of town in the late fall, and in December of 2014, the checks bounced due to a separate separate check being cash that was meant to be held. Respondent states that there were issues with the central heat and air unit in the summer and that it was finally fixed after numerous calls by the respondent to the owner and property manager. Respondent states that respondent spent some of the respondent's own money to fund the repairs on the house to keep the room renters comfortable. Respondent states that there was a time or two that a utility was shut off. Respondent thinks it was cable because respondent did not always make it back to respondent's post office box in respondent's old hometown to retrieve the mail and bills in a timely manner, but respondent called and got it turned back on right away. Respondent provided the respondent's lease with the owner as well as the sublease with the 
complainant. It is legal counsel's opinion that there are potential problems with this transaction in terms of the Tennessee Uniform Residential Landlord Tenant Act and possi possibly some contractual issues. However, respondent was not acting as an agent for anyone involved, but was acting as on behalf of respondent's old le own leasehold interest. Therefore, it is legal counsel's opinion that there are no apparent violations of track statutes and rules, and the recommendation is to dismiss. Move to dismiss. Second. Motion by Commissioner Franks, seconded by Commissioner Hills. This complaint be dismissed. Discussion. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The motion passes unanimously. 13. 2015015651. Trek opened a complaint against respondent, previously a principal broker, for potential to failure to supervise respondent affiliate broker in case number 2015015561 above. Respondent was affiliate broker's principal broker from December 11, 2014. Through Kirby. I'm disappointed this commission if somebody hadn't already made a motion. Well, I wasn't sure if it <laughs> needed to be in file. Motion to dismiss. Second. Motion by Ms. Hill, seconded by Ms. Franks. This complaint be dismissed against the previous licensee's principal broker. And typically when this commission finds that the licensee did nothing wrong, it's hard to say the principal broker failed to supervise. And that's what the motion is in front of us at this point. Are you ready to vote? Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. 14. You when somebody was going to cut me off. I uh, know. No. <laughs> <laughs> 2015014631. A complaint was filed against respondent, principal broker, by a seller stating that respondent failed to pay off complainant's mortgage <coughs> and ag as agreed to in the sale of complainant's property. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Move to uh, refer to litigation monitoring. Is there a second to that motion? Second. First of all. Second by Ms. Franks. So I have a motion by Commissioner McMullen, second by Commissioner Franks, that we skip all this narrative and go down to the very end of the narrative where counsel says this is in court. And so let's just see what the court says before we make a decision. That's what the motion is in front of us at this point. Are you ready to vote? I am. All right, let's do it then. Those in favor of the motion vote aye. 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 Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. Mr. Chairman, you might explain that, that we get all of this in advance to read also too. Yeah, so this, they... Although we can't discuss it between ourselves, counsel provides their narrative or summary and their recommendation for us to digest because as fast as she reads, if we didn't do that, we would just have a hard time understanding what the real issues were. Nothing personal. You do a great job. Thank you. Yes. Continue I now. can go slower if you'd like. We, no. <laughs> You're good. 2015014801. Complainant was a potential buyer's agent for the subject property. Complainant via principal broker states that complainant submitted a cash offer for $35,000 on the subject property on 12-29-14. Respondent, seller's agent, told complainant that complainant's offer would be back up and since respondent had would be back up, sorry. And since respondent had another offer that was going to be considered first because the seller addendums had already been sent. Complainant states that the property closed on January 27, 2015 for $28,000. Complainant states that the property was sold again on January 29th, 2015, for $35,000 to the complainant's buyer using a different agent. Complainant believes that complainant's offer was never submitted by respondent because complainant's offer would have certainly been accepted. Complainant states that respondent did not work in the best interest of respondent's client and violated the law by not submitting complainant's offer. Complainant believes complainant should receive the commission on the sale. Respondent states that the sellers had accepted an offer prior to receiving complainant's offer as indicated in email responses and confirmation from the website. Respondent states that respondent was not involved in the resale of the property to the complainant's former client. Respondent states that a different agent contacted respondent to see if the buyer would be interested in selling the property to her client, which was the complainant's old client. Respondent gave the new agent the number of the buyer's agent. Respondent states that the same complaint was submitted to the local association, which was dismissed based on the fact that there was already an accepted contract in place before complainant submitted an offer. Supporting documents show an offer made by the first buyer on 12-21-2014 and accepted on 12-26-2014 with addendum sent to the first buyer on 12-27-2014. Email correspondence indicates that complements offer the complainant's offer was not made until December 29, 2014. Therefore, documentation indicates that the property was under contract at the time complainant's offer was submitted, which is why it was the seller did not accept complainant's offer. There's nothing indicating the respondent was involved with the resale of the property. Complainant Correspondence from the local association indicates that the complainant was found to be non-arbitrable and subsequently dismissed because an offer was accepted before complainant's offer was submitted. Recommendation is to dismiss. Motion to dismiss. Second. Motion by Commissioner to Char, second by Commissioner McMullen, that council's recommendation be adopted and this complaint be dismissed. Second was by Woods. Was Wood. it? You want us just to tell who we are? <laughs> yeah. We switch I seats without help us? I think y'all need to be <laughs> it does. A and B, Austin and Bobby. Voice. We can just... Uh, 
It hey, does. the decision of the chair is almost always final. <laughs> <laughs> almost always. <laughs> but in this case, I'll allow uh, Commissioner Wood to be the official second of that motion. Is there discussion? Let's vote then. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The motion passes unanimously. Six Marcia and I decided we just need to put a girl between them to help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure if it'd help or not, but let's spread. <laughs> That's why we have two between you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, number 16, please. 201501-4821. Track open to complaint against the principal Motion to dismiss. Thank you, Ms. Hills. Motion by Commissioner Hill, seconded by Commissioner McMullen that this complaint be dismissed against the principal broker. Is there discussion? Let's vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The motion passes unanimously. 17. 2015015131. Complainant retained respondent to assist complainant in purchasing a house. Complainant states that respondent did not provide a copy of the buyer's agreement at the time of signing or shortly thereafter, nor was it completely explained to complainant. Complainant states that complainant did not receive copies of the offers complainant put in on two other properties. Complainant states that the buyer's representation agreement only states that complainant was looking for a seventy-five or excuse me, seventy thousand dollar house, and makes no mention of the two bedroom, two bath with garage in a particular part of town requirement. Complainant states that complainant requested to see a particular property to which respondent responded that it needed work and wouldn't qualify for FHA financing. Complainant believes that the pictures indicate otherwise. Complainant states respondent consistently suggested houses above complainant's budget or out of the complainant's target area and would speak negatively of properties under $75,000. Complainant states that respondent suggested complainant view a particular house which complainant ended up viewing via, resp via respondent's cell phone flashlight because there were no utilities. Complainant states respondent continually suggested complainant should buy the home that it wouldn't last long. Complainant states complainant repeat, repeatedly told respondent that complainant was not interested and it was over budget. Complainant states respondent gave complainant misinformation about how the repair escrow would affect financing for a HUD house. Complainant states complainant received the contract and corrected information when complainant signed the HUD contract. Complainant contacted respondent on April 9, 2015, requesting a copy of the buyer's representation agreement, and respondent told complainant it was for a year because for a year agreement because complainant was looking at short sales. Complainant states complainant never stipulated that complainant was only interested in short sales. Complainant requested that the contract be terminated to which respondent responded insinuating that complainant's religious and financial prudence were the reasons complainant had not bought a home. Complainant states Respondent then demanded $500 to terminate the contract. Complainant states that respondent is not trustworthy and complainant wishes to be released from the agent from the agreement without penalty. Respondent states that complainant never went through with any of the properties she chose and, resp and used respondent's time and services with no intention of purchasing a home. Respondent states that respondent caused no harm and did everything required as a realtor. Respondent states that respondent met complainant at a property comp complainant requested to see after complainant solicited respondent via Facebook. Complainant wanted to make an offer on the house, so respondent wrote the offer and complainant signed a buyer's representation agreement there at that time. Respondent states that the complainant asked a lot of questions about everything she signed that day and all information was explained to the co complainant thoroughly. Complainant did not request any more time to review any of the documents. Respondent states that respondent provided a copy of the agreement to complainant at that time. Respondent states complainant did not get this home because seller would only take cash or a conventional loan offer which complainant could not do. Respondent states the complainant was not happy with anything complainant viewed in complainant's price range, so respondent began to look for a home slightly over the price range in order to give complainant more options. In regard to another home referenced by complainant, respondent states that it was a short sale but the lender was flexible and it was in a high selling area. Respondent was informed that it was showing quite a bit and respondent had an opportunity to get complainant's offer in first position. Respondent states that the listing agent did not inform respondent that there were no utilities, so respondent did the best respondent could do by using the cell phone flashlight. Respondent states that complainant loved the home and respondent offered to bring complainant back the next day to view the home in the daylight. Respondent states complainant said complainant wanted to sleep on it and would let respondent know the next day if complainant wanted to make an offer. The next day, complainant informed respondent that complainant did not want to view any more homes until after Lent and respondent respected complainant's wishes. Before Lent was over, complainant contacted respondent to see a home which complainant loved and placed an offer on the HUD home. Complainant states that HUD, the HUD offer was placed electronically, so respondent has nothing in which to give complainant a copy. The offer was accepted, and respondent did a lot of legwork to get the HUD contract prepared for, for execution. Complainant backed out of the contract the next day, saying complainant needed to be better prepared for purchasing and would wait until a later time. Complainant expressed how thankful she was to work with respondent and the lender. Respondent states that the information regarding the HUD escrow account came from the lender, which respondent relayed to the complainant, and that respondent, complainant, and the lender had a conference call prior to the complainant signing the contract, where the lender explained how all the financing was going to work. Respondent states that complainant emailed 
on April 9, 2015, asking for a copy of the agreement and the date of termination, which respondent found odd because the last time they spoke, they left on great terms and complainant just needed more time to get finances in order. Respondent states that respondent chose to date the agreement a year from the signing date because most of respondent of the homes complainant showed interest in were short sales, which can be a lengthy process. Respondent states the complainant's re response regarding termination of the contract felt coached and went from being very pleasant and thankful to being unhappy with respondent services very abruptly. Respondent further states that the $500 fee to terminate the contract is to compensate respondent for the hours respondent spent searching for homes, meeting complainant's criteria for a month, the time spent answering questions via phone and email, and the gas money spent and mileage put on respondent's cars. Respondent states that if respondent offered bad services to the complainant, respondent would release the contact the contract without hesitation. Respondent states that at no time before requesting to be released from the agreement did complainant express dissatisfaction with respondent's services. Email text and text message documentation were submitted by complainant, none of which substanti substantiate any of complainant's claims. The buyer's representation agreement is signed by the complainant. It seems that the respondent found and showed several homes to complainant and complainant backed out of the contract complainant had on a home. Text messages show complainant stating that complainant wishes to put the home search on hold till after Lent, and respondent states, okay, I will check back with you after Easter. The same evening, complainant sends respondent a text message asking about another house. In an email... Chain in early April when complainant is trying to terminate the agreement and complainant states that during Lenten fasting, complainant received revelations and conversations about various issues and needs to make personal and business changes to be in order with them. Respondent replies stating that respondent respects complainant's position but needs clarification as it pertains to their business relationship and to complainant's intentions for the agreement so respondent would know what was going on. There's nothing to indicate that respondent said anything that would be considered offensive to the complainant and the recommendation is to dismiss. Move to dismiss. Second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Frank, second by Commissioner Hills, that this complaint be dismissed per council's recommendation. Discussion. Let's vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously. Number 18. I open a complaint against a respondent for failure to supervise. Motion by Commissioner McMullen, second, second by Commissioner Wood. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, let, let me, can I? Uh, I know, get the number in first. Yeah, let me read the number. Sorry, sorry I forgot to read the number. 2015015151. Move to dismiss. Motion by Commissioner McMullen, second by Commissioner Wood. <laughs> that council's recommendation be adopted and this complaint be dismissed. Discussion? Let's vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The motion passes unanimously. Need to vote on that last one, too. Which last one? The one that Commissioner McMullen dismissed and Commissioner Wood. We just did. Seconded. We, just, we, we did. didn't we vote. Did. We did. We did. We, we, we did. just going to roll them into one? No, no we, we got it. We got it. it. It's getting late in the day. 19. 2015015671. Respondent represented the buyer in the sale of complainant's home. Complainant states that the purchase contract on complainant's property had expired and respondent came to complainant's home to deliver an extension check. Complainant states that complainant indicated to respondent that complainant did not intend to accept the check and respondent became agitated. Complainant states that respondent told complainant that his role was to be the enforcer for which he carried a gun and made a dramatic gesture indicating he had the gun with him. Complainant believes he was threatened and now he feels as he and his wife feel uneasy in their own home. Move to dismiss. I don't want to hear more of that. Uh, so I haven't heard a second to that motion. Second. All right. Mo uh, motion by Commissioner Frank, seconded by Commissioner Wood, that this complaint be dismissed. If you're in favor of that motion, you'll vote aye in a minute. If you'd like to hear the rest of it, or you're not in favor of that motion, you'll vote no. Is there further discussion? All right. Let's vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Those opposed, no. 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 Chair rules that a majority of commission wants to hear the rest of this read into the record. Okay. All right, Ms. Kirby. Respondent states that respondent and complainant had developed an amicable working relationship and the transaction had been smooth up until April 23rd, 2015. Respondent states that he and complainant bonded over having both lived in New York City for a period of time and the fact that both of their wives were expecting babies. Respondent states that respondent received an email from complainant on April 23rd, 15, 2015, stating that they had placed multiple offers on homes which were rejected and that it was not the right time to find a home they liked. Complainant's email stated that since they did not receive an extension check from the purchaser that day or the day before, the house is no longer under contract and they were no longer interested in selling. Respondent states that respondent immediately contracted contacting complainant and respondent explained that respondent did not believe they were late on the payment and mentioned all the good faith work that the buyer was doing to get the deal ready to close. Local government approval process, getting surveys and engineering work started. Respondent states that complainant said the Change of heart was due to the fact that they had been unable to find a house they could afford in the neighborhood they desired to live in and that his attorney had advised him he could get out of the contract. 
Respondent offered to help complainant find a home and offered to speak with the, the buyer about letting complainant stay in the home longer after the baby is born. Complainant agreed to allow respondent to bring the extension check that same day. The buyer had a cashier's check ready at the bank. When he arrived, the complainant states that he was, re that he was refusing the check and is no longer bound by the deal. Respondent states that he never told complainant he was an enforcer and that the gun reference is completely out of context. Respondent states that, that they had gotten into a conversation about how dangerous it can be to be a realtor that specializes in new construction because there have been multiple break-ins and workers attacked at job sites. Respondent mentioned to complainant that many builders and realtors feel the need to protect themselves when traveling between projects. The respondent sometimes carries a gun in the car for safety. Respondent states that complainant sent a letter wishing to close the matter and the buyer decided to close the matter and move on. Respondent is deeply offended by complainant's comments and finds them unfounded and slanderous. Respondent states that respondent is a hardworking, honest person who conducts business with complete transparency and the highest moral standards. Respondent believes that complainant was trying anything he could to get out of the sales contract and now wants to cause respondent harm by hurting his reputation. The sale of complainant's property appears to have been contingent upon the buyer getting proper zoning approval from the local government. In light of the contingency, the purchase and sale agreement had provisions for extensions on the closing date. It is unclear to legal counsel whether or not the payment was late since it would have been only a one-day differentiation. However, both parties signed a mutual release agreement with the earnest money going to the buyer. There was nothing provided to substantiate any threat made by the respondent, and the recommendation is to dismiss. Motion by Commissioner Frank, seconded by Commissioner Wood, that this complaint be dismissed. Are you all still in on that? Mm -hmm. We're all right. Okay, just want to make sure. <laughs> is there a discussion? Let's vote. Those in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That motion passes unanimously to the audience. I generally tell you all how many complaints we have to handle so you can start figuring out when this thing's going to be over. Well, today we have 20. Number 20, Miss. <laughs> 2015015681. Check on Motion to dismiss. Motion. Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion by Commissioner McMullen. Did you get the number in, read into the record? Yes. yes. Okay. Second by Ms. Hills that this complaint be dismissed per council's recommendation. Is there discussion? I hear none. Those in favor of the motion vote aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The motion passes unanimously. All right. Ms. Kirby, do you have anything else to come before us today, like a, a report of any kind or anything? Um, nothing else. Thank you. I have a question. Ms. Hills. I'm sorry, I have a question. You don't so be sorry. When we dismiss, is that put in the file or does it just disappear? I, I've never been clear of that. Um, it goes in the file and then they they get the complainant and the respondent both get let right? Letter. Both parties get letters saying that the complaint has been dismissed. Okay. But your question is if you have a if you ask for a certified license history, like just because you had a complaint, it would be like a charge. It's dismissed. I mean, if it was dismissed, it doesn't show up on your license history. If that's, if that's what you wanted to, I mean, that if that's really your question. Going. It's almost as if you get charged with something with the police and it never goes anywhere. You're not convicted. I mean, oh, sort of, it's kind of the same so thing. So Commissioner Bloom did something and it couldn't have, you know, that there were three things in his file that have been dismissed. That would not be part of your certified license history because there was no disciplinary action that was taken. Thank you. Thank you for asking that for me. <laughs> you behind me, there, Commissioner Bloom. You're welcome. <laughs> what did Bloom do? <laughs> Three things. Three things. Doesn't, doesn't matter. Apparently, it's not in the file anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, commissioners. Anything else to come before us today? All right, then. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning, sharp. Got court proceedings. Have a safe night. Sign out. Make sure you sign out. <laughs>